בוקר טוב, ברוכים הבאים לכנס אתגרים לעולם בריא יותר. אני אעבור בגלל האורח שלנו לאנגלית. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our symposium on challenges for a healthier world. Uh, we are still a rather small crowd. The people of, of uh, Tel Aviv are used to uh, sleep longer, but uh, we'll start anyway. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you all here. Let me just tell you a little bit about the symposium. We organize symposia around the Dan David Prize each and every year in which the stars of the symposium are the laureates. Now, obviously, the star for the uh, science, for life sciences, for biomedical sciences, is uh, this year uh, Robert Gallo. Uh, he will be introduced a little later on. Um, anyway, this symposium is a great experiment, I think. In addition to the Dan David Laureate, which is uh, which is the star every year, uh, we have two um, senior members of, uh, senior academic members of the Tel Aviv University staff, but in addition, and this is the very uh, good and welcome initiative of uh, Alexi, who will be introduced in a minute, uh, to incorporate lectures of graduate students, PhD students, into the program, and obviously uh, these uh, programs, um, uh, or their research programs, uh, fit several aspects of uh, global public health. So I'm very excited to perform these, this uh, initial and exciting uh, experiment, and I'm really looking forward to this uh, combination. Uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing to you the president of Tel Aviv University, Professor Tzvi Galil, who will greet the audience. Good morning. Uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome you this morning. Unfortunately, I uh, I won't be able to stay because I have about 15 items on my, my agenda, uh, my schedule today. And uh, this, this is a welcome conference around uh, uh, Bob Gallo. Uh, uh, I'm happy to tell you that Tel Aviv University was one of the first to recognize his greatness because he got an honorary degree from Tel Aviv University already in the 80s, I believe. And. Uh, he uh, told very fascinating stories when he got the Dan David Prize. Uh, uh, one of them uh, has uh, some personal impact on my career. Uh, you know, I'm a computer scientist and I never thought of getting into science, the, the science magazine. And uh, even though I was doing even algorithms uh, concerning uh, DNA sequencing, uh, but I, I, I was too technical for science, but uh, now that he got the uh, Dan uh, David Prize, uh, he told the story how he got this information for me, and he wrote, there was an article in Science about it, so now I'm, I'm in science, so I might have a future. Uh, the other amazing story, even more amazing, is that Yafa Kedar, that was dean here for 20, 30 years ago, when? I don't know. I uh, know. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, saved his life because uh, she convinced him to stay one more day in Israel uh, and he missed a flight that uh, was brought down by terrorists I think in 72 or 1972 or 1973 and, and of course the, 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 topics, the topic of this symposium is very important everything around biomedical here is very important both in life science and in the medical school uh, we just have in the magazine uh, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this magazine, issue of the magazine uh, about drug development, pipeline, drug development, and, and about de developing in a dose of optimism. So it covers many of the 
some half a dozen, but that's very small sample of what's going on in, in Tel Aviv University uh, concerning drugs and drug delivery and uh, the thing connected uh, to public health. And I'll use this opportunity again. Uh, uh, one of the speakers, Mot Kishani, received the Israel Prize, and of course, uh, many, many institutions can claim him, but we, of course, claim him too. So congratula congratulations, Motke. So I'm sure you'll have a, a, a great symposium. I, I just heard that over 200 people registered, but I'm sure that by 11, some of them will show up. So enjoy. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Galil. I now call on Professor uh, Yossi Mikori, Dean of the Faculty of, Life, of uh, Medicine, uh, to uh, address you also on behalf of uh, the Dean of Life Sciences, who couldn't unfortunately be here. Yossi. Uh, good morning, everybody. I think I'm going to see you. Uh, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, symposium of challenges for a healthier world. Personally, I have, uh, I would say, a personal interest being not only the dean, but also immunologist. And uh, the first time I met uh, with Dr. Gallo, he, of course, uh, doesn't remember it. That was, I believe, his first time he came here at the early, I mean, I think late 70s, talking about uh, his first discovery that I'm going to allude to uh, just in a second. So let me dedicate uh, two or three minutes to our guests today. Uh, from the outset of his career, Dr. Gala sought to establish the importance of retroviruses in human diseases. He has been multiply honored, including the Lasker and other prestigious awards, for three uh, signal achievements all contributing either directly or indirectly to improving global public health. Uh, the first one is the discovery and identification of uh, what at that time was described as T-cell growth factor, later on known as interleukin-2, as a critical factor for T-cell proliferation and maturation. Uh, the second achievement uh, is his contribution to understanding of human T-cell leukemia viruses as a cause of human malignancy. Dr. Gallo's third achievement, and to my mind, my mind his important, most important contribution of huge significance to global health is his role in the development of a robust simple blood test for HIV, leading to the discovery of HIV as the cause of AIDS. No words can overemphasize the impact and significance of these uh, discoveries. We at the Sackler School of uh, Sackler Faculty of Medicine and uh, uh, Faculty of Life Sciences and Tel Aviv University are honored and proud and pleased to be able to host Dr. Gallo and congratulate him for a well-deserved, prestigious Dan David Prize. Let me dedicate uh, two minutes uh, to uh, Professor Motke Shani. Motke, uh, I think for the Israelis, I mean, nobody has to describe his immense impact on uh, the development of the medical system and health uh, uh, system here in Israel. Uh, his uh, very impressive achievements has, has recently been recognized by the State of Israel, bestowing upon him just two weeks ago uh, the uh, prestigious, uh, prestigious uh, Israel Prize during uh, our last Independence Day. More specifically, and talking about the Sattler Faculty of Medicine, Motke was the driving force, the real driving force in establishing a new uh, School of Public Health just three or four years ago, which I believe and, and ensure that within the next few years is going to become a leading school, not only nationally, but also, also internationally. And I'm once again also uh, very happy uh, to be able to host Motke today and to listen once again to his usually very stimulating and interesting talks about the future of uh, health uh, systems and uh, medicine in general. Last but not least, our students. Uh, it would be very interesting to listen to what you have to say. I've just uh, overlooked some of your uh, uh, posters. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time to get into details. But anyhow, we are sure that uh, these are going to be uh, found as very stimulating, high-caliber uh, research projects. 
And uh, as always, we are sure that we are producing excellent scientists with a very promising future. So thanks all of you, and I wish all of you a very interesting symposium today. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McCory. I'd like now to introduce Alexia Munz, the uh, graduate student. He's nearly, he's nearly a doctor uh, that actually initiated uh, and had the original idea of, of making graduate students a part of uh, this important symposium. It's a great pleasure to introduce Alexi. Alexi. Thank you, Itzhak, for the opportunity to represent the young generation of Israeli scientists and Dan David scholars. The Dan David Prize is now in its eighth year. It has been a highlight of science, granting the prize to breakthrough scientists from a wide spectrum of fields. Each year, the Dan David Prize laureate is invited to Tel Aviv University for a symposium, and this year we are very excited to welcome Robert Gallo, which was awarded for his major contribution to the HIV research field and public health. However, Dan David Prize Venture not only awards prestigious and highly competitive prize for leading scientists of the world, but also it fosters new generation of scientists by awarding annual scholarships for outstanding students, and many young investigators made their first steps of the scientific road throughout these scholarships. And yet, this year, the director of the Dan David Prize, Madal Fischer, initiated a whole new dimension in encouraging young scientists by providing us with the opportunity to present scientific achievements for the first time at this annual symposium. And today, together with leading scientists, four exceptional PhD students from Tel Aviv University will present their recent, uh, recent accomplishment in the constantly developing area of the biomed research. In this sense, today's symposium cuts across traditional boundaries boundaries of time, boundaries of space, boundaries of the scientific curiosity, because it links between today's laureates and potential laureates of the future. The promotion of science at the level of PhD and master students by providing forums such as this one is absolutely vital. It is particularly essential in difficult global economic circumstances which we are currently experienced with. We shall look and invest in the future of science because that's what is going to design the rest of our lives. In this respect, I wish that it would be the only first enthusiastic step that was taken by the Dandavid Prize, yielding many more creative initiatives in the time to come. I thank very much Itzhak Witz and Jonathan Gershoni for formulating the idea and organizing the event. Thank you, and I wish us all enjoyable conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexi. Uh, it is now we start with the science part. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Mordechai Shani. Uh, I'm not going to repeat his praises. Uh, he was uh, praised already by the president and by the dean. Uh, <clears throat> Just, I just want to add one thing that maybe would sound as divulging a secret, but it is not because it can be found on the, um, on the website of the Dan David Prize. Professor Shani was a juror uh, in the, in the uh, scientific committee who uh, selected uh, Robert Gallo for the Dan David Prize. So uh, that's a extra pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Shani. Motke, please. Professor Shani will talk about uh, challenges or problems facing health care in Israel towards the next decade. Good morning to all of you. <clears throat> As Professor Witt said, I was a member of the committee that had to read the curricula of 22 people, and we have other global problems without AIDS 
for example, malaria, yet it was clear from the beginning that Professor Gallo is the right candidate to get the prize, and I would like to congratulate him. I shall try in the next 15 minutes to analyze the problems that are facing the Israeli healthcare system in the next decade. Currently, Israel has a very good healthcare system comparable to other Western countries in the European continent or Australia and New Zealand. I say comparatively because there is no good healthcare system in the world. We have many pitfalls, yet relatively Israel is one of the top in the world. The good healthcare system in Israel is achieved by a relatively low percentage of the GDP, which is around 8%. We don't have any of the problems that are facing currently the healthcare system in the United States, about which I'm sure you're reading these days. Firstly, all Israelis are insured. Secondly, we don't have the problem of underinsured. In the United States, there are 140 million people which are not insured or underinsured. And health expenditure in Israel is achieved by less than 50% of the healthcare system in the United States, while our quality is much better. Without any doubt, the excellent American institution, whether it's Mass General, John Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, and others. But when you speak about the global public health of the United States, unfortunately, it's lousy. However, like any other country in the world, Israel is facing several problems towards the second decade of the century, several of which are typical only to Israel. One of the major problems is the inability of our government for the last 40 years to free itself from managing hospital. 45% of acute care hospital, and 80% of the psychiatric hospitals are governmental run. The daily management of hospitals adversely affects the ability of the government to perform its national responsibilities. Most of the hospitals are ready, from the managerial point of view, to be trust. However, the government is hesitant in deciding in which direction to go, and practically speaking, the lack of a leader hinders the programs, progress of this process. This is one of the major obstacles in shaping the Ministry of Health to perform the duties towards the second decade. The other two problems relate to the Israeli health bill. One is the exclusion of psychiatric services from the services of the HMOs. This distinction between diseases of the body and diseases of the mind is illogical. However, the restoration of psychiatric services is a long process. Till today, we have achieved two important reforms. One is the psychiatric rehabilitation law of the year 2000, and the secondly is the restructuring of the psychiatric hospitals. Israel is now in the middle of an effort to try and transfer the legal responsibility of providing health care from the mental problems from the government to the HMO. While here the battle is a political one in the Knesset, the issue of nursing homes is a more economic one. Currently, the government is responsible to providing nursing home hospitalization to people who are eligible by a mean test. Provision of this by the HMO is not limited by mean test, and therefore, the transfer of patients at the end of their life to nursing institutions 
to the HMO as financial implication. However, as it is currently stated, the HMO don't have any incentive to initiate preventive measures to decrease the deterioration of the patient population towards the need for nursing home hospitalization. If these two problems, the psychiatric care and nursing home hospitalization, can be accomplished and restored to the HMO, the health bill of 1994 will have achieved its original goal. One of the problem, the major problem of Israel is the high rate of private expenditure on Enska. The current rate is nearly 40%, which is one of the highest in the Western world. The impact of this problem is mainly on poor families. Currently, there are discussion about this issue. I do hope that eventually, even by a gradual process, the co-payment of the two lowest percentiles of the Israeli population will be abolished. Israel has a particularly unique problem in relation to the number of acute beds in Israel. While all of the Western countries have difficulties in closing acute care bed, Israel is the only Western country where there is a demand to add acute care bed. Israel has two acute beds per thousand, relatively a low figure, with the average occupancy of 95%, although in the winter, the average occupancy can reach 110%. The average length of stay is low, four days. I personally am one of those who had opposed strongly until now adding beds, because in a world of scarce resources, this is not a priority. However, one has to remember that contrary to Europe, there is a steady growth of the population in Israel due to the relatively high fertility rate. Currently, the influx of emigrants to Israel is not a major factor. Considering this population growth, one has to plan five years ahead and maybe add a few hundred beds in specific region. I am opposing to adding new hospitals in places like Ashdod, because in this world of high technology in Elska, a 300-bed hospital cannot provide a high quality of care. Israel is also unique in the Western world, facing a shortage of physicians in the next decade. Many of the physicians who emigrated to Israel will retire next year. The immigration rate currently is low, and the local production of physicians is not enough. Although there will be an increase in the number of physicians who will graduate from the four current medical school, still I believe that a, a fifth medical school is essential. Building such a school in the Galil will have also a very positive impact on the development of the region. We have only to remember that if we are talking about a new medical school, the student of this school will be physician only in the year 2020, in a completely different world, in a world where most of the teaching has to be in the community and the world where the interaction between the physicians and the patient will be different. And therefore, we shall have, at the beginning of July, an international conference in Israel with the presence of the President of Israel trying to ask ourselves who has to be the physician of the third decade in Israel. An international problem, which also exists in Israel, is the inequality of healthcare system. 
while a reduction of copayment can have a positive contribution, the impact of poverty and especially education on the use of healthcare is a dominant factor for which I do not see any major solution in any place in the world. Like in any other Western country, the major problem of healthcare services is chronic disease rail. Israel is trying several models of disease management combined with technology. This trend has to continue together with new paradigms of payment method to physician. Since communication between patient and their physician is shifting towards the internet and transmission of medical data electronically, physician have to receive payment for services who do not include personal encounter with patient. Another major problem is the yearly financial increase of the new drugs and technology to be included in the health basket. One has to recall that we are in a world of rationing. The target achieved two years ago of approximately $100 million per year is suitable, yet there is no guarantee that this level of increase will be kept. Although the issue of quality of care has been a very important item on the agenda for the past, last, past 10 years, it is still a major issue of concern and this continues to be a difficult defining good quality of care, especially in hospitals. The topic will continue to be given significant attention over the next decade. Together with the question of quality, more questions about cost effectiveness will come up, combined with the issue of rationing of public services. At last, but not at least, is the issue of public health. Infectious diseases, including AIDS, is not a major problem in Israel. However, the issue of environmental health is a problem which has not received enough recognition until now, but will prevail in the next decade. Even being in the best countries in the world regarding healthcare is not an easy task. There is no country in the world with an optimal system. Each has its problem and pitfalls. Even being among the best, we continue to work on the ongoing challenges with new ones always arising, certain that this will strongly impact the shaping of healthcare system in the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shani. Apparently, Professor Shani would not like to uh, reply to any questions. <laughs> but if there are any, uh, well, are there any questions I can't see? Apparently not. So thank you very much. Um, this was an example of a being on time. And uh, Robert Gallo probably knows what it means. Um, a private joke. Um, the next speaker is going to be a graduate student from the uh, medical, from the Sackler Medical Faculty, um, and this is Tomer Cooks. Uh, as you see, not all lectures were centered around AIDS. AIDS is surely a, one of the major public health problems all over the world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in the more advanced world, other diseases such as cancer, neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases uh, pose also important uh, uh, threats for public health, and 
the uh, next lectures actually will, uh, uh, will um, address those issues. So I have now the pleasure of calling Tomer Cooks. Uh, Tomer um, is, I know Tomer, I was on his Vada Melava, uh, which means the, the committee that accompanies the graduate student from the beginning of the studies uh, until the end of his studies. And uh, I can tell you now a secret. I was very impressed of Tomer. So, Tomer, please. Thanks. Tomer will talk about a novel radiation therapy approach for the treatment of solid tumors. Thank you, Professor Witt. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I can't even begin to explain how honored I am standing here in front of you in this Dan David Symposium, and therefore I won't, and I'll just skip right into my talk, which, as you can all see, will discuss a novel radiation therapy approach for the treatment of solid tumors. And uh, we will dedicate a moment for some general background. As you may already know, cancer has overtaken heart diseases as the world number one killer. And again, as many of you may already know, uh, most of the uh, tumors discovered are categorized as solid tumors. And furthermore, the majority of those solid tumors are um, treated with some form or some kind of radiation therapy utilizing ionizing radiation. And maybe the most, uh, the classic and traditional and most common uh, approach for treating uh, solid tumors uh, using radiation therapy is, uh, of course, the external beam radiation therapy, as you can see here. Uh, very accurate beams of ionizing radiations are sent from outside to the target zone, which is, of course, the malignant tissue, uh, hoping or with the attempt to maximize the dose given or delivered to the tumor itself while sparing the healthy tissues surrounding the, uh, the tumor. And I will just point out another alternative to uh, EBRT, to the external beam radiation therapy, which is brachytherapy uh, that basically uh, uh, means that if we would be able to get closer to the tumor, even into the tumor, inside the tumor, we would be able to deliver even higher doses of radiation and sparing, while sparing the uh, healthy tissues even more successfully. But to sum this section up, I can just uh, say that uh, all or most, most of the approaches uh, utilizing ionizing radiation are giving use uh, either with X-ray, uh, which we could refer to as gamma rays, or uh, electrons, which we could refer to as beta particles. So gamma, yes, and beta, yes. Why not use alpha particles? Alpha, alpha radiation is another form of ionizing radiation. Why not use them for the treatment of uh, solid tumors? And this question may get even more, uh, even more interesting after seeing this little animation here demonstrating the uh, destructive abilities of alpha particles. Uh, you will see what happens when an electron uh, hits the DNA molecule, which is, of course, the uh, main target of the cell we want to destroy. And then we'll compare it to what happens with, uh, when alpha particle traverses the same target. And let's see. Let's hope it works. Yes, this is the electron, and we, when it hits the DNA, you can see that the damage that it causes is relatively easy for the DNA mechanisms the repair mechanisms to, to repair. And this chunky fellow here is the alpha particle, and when it hits the DNA, you can see that the damage it causes is pretty severe, and the uh, mechanisms of DNA repair might find it very hard to recover from. And uh, if alpha particles are that destructive, I'm getting back to my question, why not use them uh, for cancer treatment? And I'm not sure I'm surprising anyone here, but the uh, uh, the answer for that problem is, of course, range. Excuse me. Is of course range. Um, alpha particles, even though very destructive and very energetic, they lose their energy very rapidly, unlike gamma and beta particles, uh, which can travel major and significant distances inside our bodies. 
and alpha particle wouldn't travel more than 100 microns. And that was considered a too big of an obstacle, of course, uh, for, the treat for the development of any approach utilized or based on alpha particles. And let's, I will ask a key question. How can we uh, deposit and disperse alpha particles in a large tissue volume? That's what we want to achieve. That wasn't achieved thus far. And one of the optional answers may lie in this technique I'm going to present here, which is diffusing alpha emitters radiation therapy, or we can call it DART. And we'll understand some of the basic principles of uh, this method. And I'm not going to get too deeply to the uh, nuclear physics, but just the basics uh, of this, uh, this uh, system. This is the thorium-228 decay chain we are working with. And uh, as you can see, of course, it originates with thorium-228, which is the father of this uh, decay chain. And when an alpha particle pops out, recoils out of this thorium atom, of course, alpha particle is actually two protons and two neutrons. So it becomes radium-224, and again, a decay uh, happens, and it becomes radon-220, and so on and so forth, until this uh, decay chain stops with uh, the stable uh, this table uh, lead 208 over here, and it radiates no more. So maybe the most unique, the most unique member of this chain is the radium 224. Note that this half half lifetime of the of the radium 224 is almost four days. That basically means that if we would be able to collect many of these atoms on a kind of a device, a little wire maybe and collect this atom on its surface in a manner that they would be captured, they won't get washed away, we would be able then to insert this little device into a solid tumor and hope that the rest of the decay products over here would spring away off this wire and travel, maybe using diffusive mechanisms or, con uh, or using the blood uh, inside to significant distances out of uh, the wire. Note that the uh, half-life times of those progeny of the daughters of radium are pretty short. They could be seconds and minutes and hours. That means that they won't travel too far. We don't want them to get out of the uh, tumor itself, of course, and damage healthy tissues. How is it practically done? So the thorium-228 is actually this panel here, this generator, and we are able to electrost electrostatically collect the radium-224 atoms recoiling out of the thorium, and we are able to capture them on this little source or wire here. And uh, after we can do that, we have a ready-to-use dart seed. And I'm going to emphasize once more this fairy dust. Uh, you can see springing out or recoiling out of the wire, not the radium-224 atoms themselves. They are captured tightly on the wire. They are the short-lived progeny, uh, which can uh, then do the damage. Now, all left to do is take this little device, this little wire, and insert in the most simple way you can imagine into a solid tumor and hope it would do its magic. And uh, now I'm going to take you with a little time machine and skip a few years of uh, research in, win in which we, uh, we investigated the interaction of alpha particles and the and uh, the ability to kill uh, different cell lines and uh, cancerous cultures, and of course the development of the dart wire to its final shape. And let's suppose I have in one hand a, a final version of this dart wire, and on the other hand a mouse bearing a solid tumor. What would happen when I insert this wire into the tumor? And the first example I'm going to show you is the uh, squamous cell carcinoma tumors we transplanted in bulb C mice. And you can see this divided to three treatment groups, uh, the blue one was treated with the dart wire or radium-224 wire, and uh, as opposed to two control groups, one wasn't treated at all, and the second one was treated with an inert wire, which was, of course, identical in shape to the active one. And you can see the major effect that it had on the, uh, on the tumors, on the tumor volumes and tumor developments, and you can see here two representative photographs, one uh, of, uh, uh, here you can see the tumor of the animal not treated with the dart wire, and here you actually can see the dart wire sticking out of the animal's body where uh, the tumor was supposed to be. That was taken in the same day, of course. We also, 
We also saw a major effect on life expectancy of the uh, animals, and uh, along the years we gathered many indications that apart from the, uh, uh, the effect we had on primary tumors, we also uh, are able to uh, inhibit the metastatic process. That was very important for us to see. And I'll just say that along the years we, we studied, I believe, something like 18 different uh, uh, kinds of solid tumor models uh, from various sites uh, of human tissue and mouse tissue. And uh, this is one of the most prominent examples of uh, human lung carcinoma tumors. Uh, we uh, transplanted in nude mice. And you can see the extreme effect. About 80% of the tumors were completely eradicated. That's, what, that's with just one dart wire. And uh, of course, the uh, effect on life expectancy was robust as well and uh, another representative photographs, of course, with uh, an animal who was fortunate enough to receive the dark treatment and one who wasn't. Now, let's understand what happens inside those tumors. Okay, so we saw that we, if we stick this wire into the tumor, we, see, we can see the effect, but we wanted to understand the, uh, the distribution of the radioactive uh, atoms inside the, the tissue we are treating and to understand in which manner they are dispersed inside. And this was an essay developed by Dr. Leo Razi, who I believe is sitting here today. And I haven't saw him, but I hope he's here. Anyway, um, we were able to take the treated tumors and separate them from the wires and then cross-section them with very thin histological slide, slices. And we were able to analyze those little sections and you can see here the radio radioactive signal over here. And this is the whereabout of the uh, wire. Of course, it was inserted horizontally. And you can see the dispersion of the radioactive cloud surrounded it. And we can then, we were able then to translate this uh, radioactive signal to those in gray. Of course, those was very important for us because that means how much radiation this, this did this tissue absorb, and uh, we measured uh, quite thousands of graves around here, but there was a rapid fall off to about 50 and 20 and 5. You can see the distances here in this scale of millimeters. And this was very nice to see the, the this distribution was very uh, nice in the squamous cell carcinoma model, and we wanted to see if does, does this distribution uh, correlates with the tissue damage? So we stained the same section. And you can see that the purplish areas stands for living cells who weren't affected since they weren't exposed to significant doses, but where significant doses were, were distributed, you can see the massive necrotic area uh, formed by the uh, radioactive wire. Now, if we can do it with one wire, we might as well do it with more. Here is an example of a treatment with two wires. And uh, again, we can analyze and understand and translate it to those and see the necrotic domains formed by the dart wires. And indeed, when we treated uh, groups of animals with two dart wire insertions, uh, they were ge geometrically spaced from one another we saw that the effect was even enhanced. And the ultimate goal, as uh, our point of view, is actually to uh, understand in which wire arrangement, both geometric, uh, geometrically and how many dart wires to insert, which, in what uh, activities should we uh, apply on a given tumor so we can create a kind of a tailor-made uh, uh, treatment for uh, a certain tumor to be completely eradicated. And in the minute I have left, I will just talk about what we're dealing with right now. So as I told you, we are, we studied about 18, maybe more, solid tumors from different kinds and types. And there were ones that were very responsive, as you saw, the squamous cell carcinoma and the colon carcinoma and the lung carcinoma that I showed you. But there was some that were, there were quite a few who were pretty resistant. And uh, one of the examples is pancreatic carcinoma. <laughs> Here you can see a, a group of cell lines who were radiated in vitro uh, for uh, 
using alpha particle fluxes. And you can see here that we needed much more energy and much more alpha particles to kill the pancreatic cell lines, there are three of them over here, as compared to the squamous cell carcinoma cell lines, there are two of them over here, who died more uh, easily and by less uh, irradiation using alpha particles. This was the first indication that even in the cell level, there's a big difference between tumors. One would be responsive, one would be resistant. And furthermore, when we checked the patterns of radioactive distribution in those tumors, so the squamous cell carcinoma you saw already, I'll show it once more, uh, you can see the very nice uh, effect and dispersion of the, the atoms, they go far away, and you can see here the uh, necrotic domain formed by those atoms. However, when checking the pancreatic carcinoma, you can see that the dispersion was quite condensed and almost no necrosis was observed in this, two, in, in this tissue. And this was the second indication that the, there is a big difference between those two tumors and they won't respond the same way to the DART treatment. And indeed, you can see here that the squamous cell carcinoma was very responsive and the pancreatic carcinoma was considered very uh, radioresistant. And I think the uh, key question for us is to understand, understand which mechanisms control this radio resistance, radio sensitive scale. And if we would be able to, to understand those mechanisms, we might be able to control or interfere and shift the resistant tissues to more, more to the sensitive side of the scale. And that's, uh, in the future, we would be able maybe to predict which tumor would be treatable using the DART system. And with this, I will end and thank Professor Yona Kaysari and Professor Yitzhak Elzon, both instructing me throughout the years. Uh, Professor Kaysari is from the School of Medicine, Professor Kaysari from the School of Physics and Astronomy, and I thank all the other nice and amazing and beautiful people helping along the way, and of course, Altira Medical supporting this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tomer, uh, for a very clear presentation. Are there any questions? Um, we are not very equipped, very well equipped for uh, questions, so um, I'm sure that uh, Tomer and uh, perhaps also Professor Shani would be here during the intermission and afterwards, uh, and you can ask them outside while you uh, have some coffee and uh, uh, look at the posters. So thank you very much, Tomer. The, the next lecture, sorry? Oh, there's a question. Tomer, take the, yeah, I will. Thanks. I always wonder about radiation therapy. Is there any evidence that the damaged DNA is dying cells? Any of that DNA is taken up by normal cells to reinitiate a cancer development in any model system? Do you know that? Could you repeat the last section of the Haim had DNA? Haim had DNA is a shukhar mi ataim. That's <laughs> okay. I, I'll try to, un to answer that. I don't know. Um, there are evidence uh, in the literature that uh, using ionizing radiation like alpha particles, um, there's an initiation of an inflammation like uh, processes in the tumor microenvironment and, and more, and maybe the immune system is recruited and then uh, parts of those uh, DNA and maybe uh, other elements of the, the uh, disrupted cells who were damaged by the, the, the radiation are taken and then presented in a manner that uh, uh, they would be recognized by the immune system. But uh, we haven't checked it in our systems. Okay. 
Any other questions that I'll have to uh, translate? What the method of what's the method of delivery of the wire? Oh, how do we insert it? Just put it in a syringe and then inject it. In the, it it's an it's a kind of an applicator which we could uh, know very um, accurately where we're putting, where we're leaving the, uh, but it's not, uh, there's a uh, development for, of course, if you want to get to tumors some day in the future inside the more inner the tissues of the body, you would have to uh, do it more uh, uh, sophisticatedly, but that's not my part of all, that's more engineering, so, but there are developments in this part also. And I believe there's another one? No. Any more? Thank you very much. I have now uh, the pleasure of introducing Jan Jorochin uh, from uh, Molecular Genetics of Men and Biochemistry. Um, he uh, uh, he is from also from the uh, uh, Soraski, fr sorry, uh, from the uh, uh, medical faculty, and he will talk about future horizons in nerve cell protection. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jan. I am a student of Professor Alana Gozes. Uh, uh, the title of my talk is uh, Future Horizons in Nerve Cell Protection. And uh, I will start uh, my talk with a uh, short background. Uh, this is the image of neuron. Neuron uh, is an excitable cells uh, of a neuron, neuron system that process and transmit information by, by electrochemical signaling. Neurons are the core compounds of brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. Neurons respond to stimuli and complicate the present, presence of uh, information to central nervous, nervous system that process that uh, information and send the response to other part of the body. Neurons do not go through mitosis and uh, usually cannot be repeated after being destroyed. That is the reason why uh, in our body thousands of uh, proteins provide protection for neurons from different harmful factors. One of such uh, neuroprotective peptides is uh, vasoactive uh, intestinal peptide, VIP, that show neuroprotective effect on neurons through the activation of the glial cells that produce two important peptides, ADNP and DNF. In our laboratory, we found that uh, small eight amino acid sites from each of these uh, peptides provide the same neuroprotective neuro effect as uh, full uh, proteins. We show this uh, neuroprotective effect in uh, different uh, models, such as uh, oxidative stress, electrical blockade, toxic action of ethanol, excited toxicity, beta amyloid aggregates, and others. Remarkably that uh, these peptides act at very low concentrations. Uh, many pathological factors uh, from this list are uh, described in such neurological disease like ALS. ALS is uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. ALS is an incurable progressive neurodegenerative disease affecting upper and lower motor neurons. The disorder cause muscle weakness and atrophy throughout the body as both uh, neurons degenerate, ceasing to send messages to the muscles. 
The patient may ultimately lose the ability to initiate and control all voluntary movement. ALS is typically fatal within five, seven years when control of the diaphragma is impaired and the ability to breathe is lost. The history of ALS started uh, in 1969 when uh, French doctor Jean-Martin Charcot firstly described ALS as a neurological disease. Only after 70 years, uh, ALS first time caused a public debate after the death of uh, American baseball star Louis Gehring. Only in early 90s, researchers found that uh, some ALS cases have familiar background and link uh, these cases to chromosome number 21. It was shown that uh, this is the place where located uh, Coupon zinc superoxid is mutas enzyme SOD1. In 1996, FDA approved the first and the last drug against the LS, Rilozol. But Rilozol is able only to increase the lifespan of patients by an average of three months. So, until now, LS still remains incurable and fatal disease. So, we the general goal of our research is to access the protective activity of small peptides designed in our, our laboratory against the LS pathology. First peptide that we started to check was DNAP. For this purpose, we used transgenic mouse uh, that expressing mutant SOD1 with the point mutation in position 93. This mouse model is widely used as a gold standard to test therapies for LS. Transgenic mouse because become paralyzed due to loss of motor neurons from the brain and spinal cord and have a lifespan of approximately 90 to 23 weeks. We hypothesize that chronic treatment with NAP can improve motor function and increase survival of transgenic mice. So we started with two group of mice uh, that one of them were, was treated with uh, DNAP and control group uh, was treated with the same volume of cell line. After a month and a half, we started to check motor function, and at the age of four months, we scanned all mice with MRI. Weight loss is the earliest detectable LS symptom in uh, this SOD1 transgenic mice model. And we showed that the treatment with DNAP accelerates weight gain of transgenic mice during development until 10 weeks of age. Also, we show that DNAP increased the number of staircase, stairs that uh, mice climbed during the staircase. At the, way, at the age of uh, four months, we show that mice treated with DNAP show increased number of rearing actions, that some kind of uh, motor function. And most importantly, that uh, we show that DNAP treatment significantly increased the lifespan of the mice from 125 days to 140. At the age of uh, four months, we performed MRI and found that this technique is very powerful and suitable for detection of LS pathology. Uh, so what pathological changes can be detected by MRI in the brain of transgenic mice? So we performed uh, two-to-weighted protocols, and uh, we get uh, brain images and found that transgenic mice show uh, lesions in two important motor areas. One of them is the motor trigeminal nucleus on the left panel, and the other important region is the facial motor nucleus on the right panel. Also, we shown that uh, Transgenic mice uh, have large lateral ventricles, cerebral aqueduct, and uh, lateral recess of the fourth ventricles. After that, we performed uh, MRI for dnap treated mice and showed that uh, and show, uh, improvement of the same regions. Uh, we showed that uh, DNA treatments significantly increase the secondary sensor cortex decreased a large cerebral aqueduct 
force ventricle and lateral recess of force ventricle. So all this data strongly suggests that DNAP protect again against the less pathology. So uh, we found that DNAP can be used as uh, treatment uh, of uh, a mouse LS model, and we found that DNAP treatment accelerate weight gain, protects against loss of motor neurons, significantly increase lifespan of uh, diseased mouse, and decrease seizure, uh, lesions in the sensor material cortex and decrease volume of uh, large ventricles. I want to acknowledge uh, uh, my supervisor, Professor Alana Gozes, all members of our groups, and people that uh, helped me to, to analyze MRI data, Prof, uh, Dr. Yanif Asaf and Dr. Katerin Brami. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, please. No, uh, here we perform. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? If we, you asked me about the kind of treatment that we used. Uh, in this experiment, we started treatment uh, from age of two days. Each mice uh, were injected with the uh, same volume of, uh, it was a subcutaneous injection of uh, DNAP or saline uh, from the age of two days and until end of experiment. Yeah. Uh, there are two questions there, Dr. Gallo. About peptides? Yeah, it was. We have actually we have four peptides. Uh, a, can you repeat the question, please? Ah, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was uh, uh, where from we get our peptides and the, yes. So uh, actually we're working with four peptides. We started uh, from NAP and SAL. NAP and SAL, it's a short name of uh, eight amino acids uh, active sites of a DNP and SAL, it's uh, eight active sites, eight amino acids uh, from the peptide ADNF. Um, we have also DNAP with DSAL that uh, some uh, D amino acids analogs of uh, NAP and SAL. It's four peptides that uh, we usually using in our experiments. We found that uh, these small sites, it's the most acti active sites from all lates of peptides. I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you please elaborate a little bit about the mechanism can you, of action? Yunki, can you speak to the microphone, please? I speak to the microphone, it doesn't work. But it, does it work? Can you elaborate about the mechanism of action of the peptide, how it protects the neurons? I'm sorry, can you repeat? The mechanism of action. Uh, actually, we are currently working on it, and uh, this experiment is a part of experiment that I think will help us to ask uh, on this question. We think that uh, mechanisms, it's a uh, some uh, improvement of uh, microtubuli uh, that uh, improved microtubuli and uh, normalized of uh, some uh, phosphorylated processes like uh, 
tau hypophosphorylation that others. Uh, I think that uh, NAP uh, works through so microtubuli. Any more? Uh, Alexi, yes, Moshela. Can you ask the question? I mean, the microphone is going to be a little slow and getting you to you. Yeah, we performed a couple of experiments and we show uh, that um, some peptides uh, show some um, uh, Summary is uh, some large narrow protection on uh, in, in different systems. I think we, we show that it was uh, uh, this island map together. I think. I mean, do you do the synthesis of the peptides in your lab? If we do synthesis. What was the question? If, we if you synthesize those particular peptides that you're using in your laboratory. Uh, no, yeah, I think we, uh, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Before we... Um, Before we, uh, we have now about 45 minutes for a extended coffee break. Please don't forget the uh, posters. Uh, the people have prepared them and are anxious to show the results on the posters. And before we disperse for the, for the coffee break, I'd like to express my thanks for the um, organizers of this, uh, uh, of this uh, symposium. In addition to Alexi, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Smadar Fischer and especially the, um, the RAS team, uh, Nava Shiloni Raz, who also organized the beautiful ceremony of the Dan David Prize. So give, give them a hand. We have now 45 minutes. Uh, and please be back uh, at uh, 
Let's stand. Hey, hey, just stand in one second.
אולי, שומע, זה קרוב למצלמה שלא התנקו, לא התנגשו שם בסטן. לא, אני לא רואה מפה, אני רואה את זה אותו זווית, בסדר? איזה, השארת אותו דלוק? סוללה חלשה, חזקה? רק אל תקווה עם הגובה שלך, אתה יודע, כי יש אנשים, אתה גבוה, שתי מטר תשעים. נעשה צ'ק. חמש חמש, איי איי. אצלה. איי איי.
נראה לי מושלם, כאילו, לא צריך אז להרים את הרעש. איזה עולם, כל פעם זה מרשים אותי מחדש.
רבותיי, נא לשבת. אנחנו רוצים להתחיל. עד עכשיו לוח הזמנים עבד כמו שצריך, בואו נמשיך בזה. They have a saying <coughs> that some people you don't, uh, you don't need to introduce. There's a story about the uh, Kaiser of uh, Austria, Franz Joseph, that said he doesn't need an introduction, every, everybody knows him. Now they tell about somebody that uh, was uh, visiting the Kaiser and they both went out on the balcony to uh, greet the audience. And some little guy said, uh, who is that man, meaning the Kaiser, who is that man standing next to Robert Gallo? Uh, I have a great pleasure of introducing Dr. Robert Gallo. I, uh, he really does need introduction because uh, the fact that so many people uh, came at 11.15 um, uh, shows that he really needs and does need an introduction. You're taking my time. Uh, I met Bob in 78. He, we really became good friends, I think. Uh, anyway, he's very, very well connected to Tel Aviv University. He was the first health lecturer um, in, uh, in cancer research. He, uh, this was the early 80s. A few years later, he uh, <clears throat> became an honorary doctor of uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, at present, his director and professor of the Institute of uh, Human Virology in Baltimore, Maryland, USA. Uh, there's no need to tell you what he has done in uh, HIV and AIDS research. He will give an overview of that. Uh, just to finish my short introduction, by saying how delighted and happy I am to welcome Bob again to Tel Aviv University. Bob. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Shall we give a hug? Thank you very much, Professor Witz, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, to begin with, I always need to know what to press to go forward. So hold on just a minute. Yes, okay. Yes, what, he, what Isaac said, uh, uh, already introduced, is I would like to give a, a little bit of a review of some things in the past, some lessons that came out of it, and then go on and tell you about our two, my two uh, personal interests in HIV AIDS research for the future. And I must say that in, I'll have something again in common with Isaac because, in part, um, I'm returning a bit, maybe 20, 25 percent of my time to viral oncology, that back to a little bit of cancer research. Uh, and it's because of some new findings and because of our new connection of the Institute to the Greenbaum Cancer Center at Maryland's University of Maryland School of Medicine. And uh, uh, my friends, the Greenbaums, are actually here today and have been here through this session, and they know this country very well, almost as well as I do. <laughs> so let's begin. I'd like to address the question of whether we were prepared or not. It, and I know many people in the audience uh, are very young and could not know that period of time. And I'd like to say it was a yes and a no. It's yes in that we had a lot of recent, at the time, technological advances to take advantage of. For example, because of research in animal model systems and our recent discovery of the first human retrovirus, the leukemia virus, HTLV-1, 
we had a, I would like to call a scaffold of understanding of the replication cycle of animal retroviruses to apply to man and of HTLV-1. We, we knew steps in the pathway. So we had this. We had monoclonal antibodies. We had molecular hybridization. We didn't have PCR, but we had lots of things. But then I think con on a broader framework, uh, intellectually, conceptually, public health, et cetera, we were not prepared so well. And I think there's some lessons in that uh, because I come to the bottom of the slide. I am thinking that we have only a memory span of approximately 25 years. For example, I think if there was no AIDS as of tomorrow, we would keep thinking about serious infectious diseases. But let's say there was no more discussion of flu or SARS. In other words, if there was nothing for 25 years, we would start to put away the tools and the ideas of microbiology. I can testify to that personally in the case of HIV and AIDS. But if you read the history of influenza and of 1950 polio, you'll see that even remarkably with 1918, 1919, people were thinking that infectious diseases as causes of serious fatal disease at, a, at an epidemic level were more or less passe that we should focus on chronic degenerative diseases. If you read the history of polio, you can see that in the 1930s or so, the lessons of the flu were still around, that great, great flu epidemic. But by 1950s, the, or when the polio epidemic was really taking off by 1950, the textbooks about polio say the same thing. We should turn to chronic degenerative diseases. We don't have any need to think about serious, fatal, global epidemics any longer. I came to the National Cancer Institute at NIH in 1965. From 1965 until the beginning of the 70s, we had a healthy respect for serious infectious disease. We also had a serious respect for viruses as possible causes of human cancer, though none had been demonstrated to be so. But by the mid-late 1970s, 25, 30 years later, these remarkable biases were hallmarks of the field. Infectious diseases are over as serious problems as epidemics. I don't mean hospital-derived or a strep throat or anything like that. In the industrial world, therefore, therefore we could forget about it because it was a problem for those people, which today would not be politically correct, but it would also not be scientifically correct. There, and the evidence for this is that the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, was threatened with closure and certainly was compressed. And that was with scientific advice to our leadership in government. And also, some great medical schools of the East Coast of the United States closed their departments of microbiology. The microbe would be the playground for the molecular biologists. And the third bias no viruses cause cancer in man. No infectious disease caused cancer in man was certainly prevalent and peaked in a meeting in Cold Spring Harbor in 1975 called The Origins of Human Cancer. I remember well that there were three virologists in the room, and I think our seating was somewhere near the men's room in the back. So there was a very strong feeling that all cancer was caused by chemicals in the environment or rare genetic changes. It was kind of that primitive that not so long ago. Those biases were shattered by the early 1980s, as you know. Viruses, or let's say microbes in general, are now involved, known to be involved in close to 20% of human cancers on a global scale. I would predict that this will increase within the next 10 years to another 5% or so. Retroviruses were found in humans, shown to cause a particular leukemia and fatal neurologic disease that resembles multiple sclerosis. One of the great pandemics of history appeared and is caused by still another retrovirus, the subject of this overview from now on. But before jumping right into HIV, I want to tell you why I think the prejudices were so strong against even the possible existence of a human retrovirus. First, 
Because of the virus cancer program of the National Cancer Institute, which went out of business by the late 1970s, which was focused in trying to find viruses causing human cancer, and particularly retroviruses, because there were a few decades of failed attempts with lots of money, that was kind of the end of it. There was also evidence in animal models that retroviruses, when they cause disease in animals, had very high replication. So it should be very easy to find them because they reproduced a lot when they caused disease. The problem with the first is that negative results mean nothing. The problem with the second is that animal models are not selected when they're difficult. They're selected when they're easy to work in a laboratory. And only a fool would select an animal with hardly detectable retroviruses, but rather one that the, there was lots of replication. There was very little evidence in higher species, primates, of retroviruses as disease-causing agents. Human sera was reported by a California group to destroy, to lice, animal retroviruses in the presence of complement of the serum. Therefore, humans were protected. The problem with the last is that they only tested little animals, and it turns out that many primate retroviruses, human serum, does not destroy. And finally, number three, the evidence in primates was soon to come in which I'll mention a very important case in a moment. There were encouraging factors, nonetheless, for us to keep looking for human retroviruses. And I want to emphasize that this part of the talk is, of course, directed at the younger people in the audience. So one point, if you think you've got some evidence for something and you feel reasonably confident that your idea is in the right track, persistence is a very important uh, quality uh, for ultimate success. And I want to tell you a truism that I was told by the director of the National Cancer Institute, who at this time sort of believed that I would have something from a little bit of data we had of hints, and said to me that when you have something that no one believes in, if you ever turn out to be right, you get twice the credit that you would otherwise. I think it's ten times. So you get more credit at the end. In any case, these were factors that helped us uh, to stay in this problem. Let me go to the bottom, biological factors. Well, first of all, an American Japanese worker in California discovered gibbon ape leukemia virus, showed that it caused a disease undistinguishable from chronic myeloid leukemia. A few years later, my colleagues and I discovered another strain of this virus, and it caused adult T-cell leukemia in gibbon apes. In addition, we all know in retrovirology that retroviruses can sometimes move from one species into another. We know that because we have fossilized evidence for it in the form of our DNA sequences, where we have a record of past infections from retroviruses that for presumably became helpful to us in time, became part of our endogenous DNA, part of our genes. So we have multiple sequences of endogenous retroviruses that we all carry. We also knew examples in nature where a retrovirus would move from one species to another, again, by looking at the DNA of ancient infections. For example, the gibbon ape leukemia virus derives from an Asian mouse. You can see the connection in the normal mouse DNA of certain Asian mice to the gibbon ape leukemia virus. The cat leukemia virus is a mixture of viruses from a rat retrovirus and the normal DNA of a cat. So you know where that came from, rat into cat. Oh, there are multiple examples of this, but they're all ancient. So we thought this was, you know, very, very rare events. Then. Within our laboratory, we had an example of an interspecies transmission from one primate to another right in front of our face. And it was gibbon ape leukemia virus that infected, which is an old world Asian ape, that infected a new world monkey known as a woolly monkey. It was, both animals were in a household of a woman in California, 
She, I have a picture of a newspaper that shows her dressing these animals like little girls. Yeah, we say only in California. But those animals fought each other, bit, etc. And the gibbon ape leukemia virus was transmitted to the woolly monkey virus who developed a sarcoma of the neck. Out of that sarcoma came virus in which an oncogene had been captured. Today it's called CIS, S-I-S, but it really is platelet-derived growth factor creating the sarcoma. But the helper virus, because the oncogene containing genome is defective and needs a helper, was gibbon ape leukemia virus. And so this was really kind of astonishing. We also had new technical advances. Reverse transcriptase discovered by Temin in Baltimore in 1970 presented me with an opportunity to enter the field of retrovirology at that time, 1970. And I decided that we could use this enzyme as a surrogate marker for the presence of a retrovirus because it's about a million times more sensitive than electron microscopy and electron microscopy is limited to so few laboratories, and you couldn't do it over a period of time and culture. Now, you need electron microscopy sometimes with a new virus, but not for surveying. So there were difficulties with this, because this viral DNA polymerase in many respects resembles the mitochondrial DNA polymerase of our cells, known as DNA polymerase gamma. So I got involved very quickly with DNA polymerase gamma, in fact, along with David Baltimore and Art Weisbach, we gave it those names, alpha, beta, gamma, for human DNA polymerases. And we found ways to distinguish it, the viral enzyme, from DNA polymerase gamma, and to use reverse transcriptase as a sensitive assay for virus. And we had to do this because, and to have it specified, because there were laboratories at that time using the enzyme assay, but not with specificity, that were claiming tumor viruses in every type of cancer, which weren't, was not true. I mean, it could be true, but not discovered to this day. So we worked on that assay, and in that same period, we found a growth factor for T cells, today known as interleukin-2. So the fact of interleukin-2, a T cell growth factor, and the fact of given ape leukemia virus strain that we isolated causing adult T cell leukemia drove us, we didn't have any choice almost, into study of T cell malignancies of man. And from then on, my own journey in science was focused on retrovirology and T cells. Let's jump right into AIDS now. I think everybody knows that this was first recognized in 1981. Clinicians noted that there was an odd, specific blood cell abnormality. CD4 T cells were disappearing, the so-called T helper cells, important for our entire immune system, important to make antibodies, important to make killer T cells, etc. In 1981 to 1982, the Center for Disease Control epidemiologist suggested that this would be caused by a new infectious agent. They were certainly clear about that. And in my view, these are the first scientific contributions. The importance of the discovery of HTLV-1 for the discovery of HIV is that it convinced scientists that humans could be infected by retroviruses and that they could cause disease. Provided techniques for the isolation of human retroviruses and stimulated the idea that AIDS might be caused by still another retrovirus. Yet, there were a great number of other theories, some of which don't appear to be very wise. For example, there were non-infectious ideas for the cause of AIDS. Amyl nitrate, or poppers, were suggested by FDA scientists as recently as almost the end of the 1980s. But this didn't fit blood transfusions, uh, nor did it fit mother-to-child transmission of something when the mother was not a drug addict. Another theory came out of the National Institutes of Health was that it might be caused by auto-immunity to blo white blood cells. What does this mean? It meant the idea was that through, quote, rough sex, white blood cells of someone might get into the bloodstream of the recipient. And then there was autoimmunity, a reaction against those blood cells, white blood cells, that started to attack the white blood cells of the individuals. When I heard that, 
theory, I said, what about women in a meeting? And the immunologists discussed it some further, and they said they were talking about rough sex. So I said again, what about women for almost three million years? So this was not a very good idea. Moreover, hemophiliac factor eight was from pooled plasma without cells that was filtered. It couldn't be leukocytes because hemophiliacs were getting AIDS. Other ideas mainly focused on infectious agents, and you see a partial list. There were probably twice that number. But I would like to remind people that as late as February 1984, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease made a claim with a small press conference and release that AIDS was caused by a new fungus. There's a story about this that I'll share with you, particularly younger people. I had told the director of the National Cancer Institute that AIDS would be caused by a retrovirus. And he called me in San Francisco, where I was at the time, and said, turn on the evening news. Why did you tell me it was a retro going to be a retrovirus when it's a fungus? I developed cardiac palpitations. I was very nervous. And then I thought Einstein said that nature is ne not cruel, but she's never so simple. It was supposed to be a new fungus that secreted cyclosporin, which we had just learned uh, knocked off CD4 T cells the previous six months. It's a little bit coincidental, isn't it? <clears throat> so I got, then I thought further about it and realized that once again, knowledge that hemophiliacs were getting AIDS made this impossible because the filtrates of the plasma, today you have the pure molecule, wouldn't allow a fungus to go through. It could only be a virus. So we promoted the idea with Max Essex at Harvard that a new HTLV-related retrovirus would likely, was the likely cause of AIDS. We based this on our experiences with HTLV-1, which targeted CD4 T cells, which caused minor immune impairment, which was transmitted by blood, sex, and mother to child, and it seemed, therefore, reasonable that a new variant emerged. This theory was the one that bore fruit, but was not precisely right, because HIV is not a member of the closely related HTLV family, only the broader class of retroviruses, completely different family of retroviruses. The last one seems absurd, but I mention it only because it goes on to this day because it's caused a lot of fatalities. You know, Mbeki in South Africa, but not limited to him. In the United States, it goes, we have documented cases as recently as last month um, where a woman was going on trial because she refused to let her, her, uh, her child be treated. The child died of AIDS. She had met Peter Duisburg, convinced her not to have therapy because the therapy caused all these problems and may have caused the AIDS itself. So Duisburg's notion was there is no AIDS. It's just a lot of variety of things. Doctors cause AIDS from surgery, anesthesia. Blood causes AIDS, doesn't need anything else. You know, completely out of this world. Yet that woman, when she was being brought to trial, died herself before the trial of AIDS. She had not treated herself or gotten treatment herself. So it actually remains still a bit of a serious problem. Excuse me for, <clears throat> as the slide said, we have made two major practical advances so far. That so far is for some time now getting a little boring that those are the two major advances, the blood test and treatment. These advances, it is noted, it's noteworthy rather, came out of basic research. So, you know, you know about therapy. It began in 1986 from Burroughs Welcome and Sam Broder at the National Cancer Institute. And then in 1995 culminated when they had triple drug therapy when the protease inhibitors were developed, joined to reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We would have had nothing if we didn't understand the replication cycle from the basic science of HIV, or if we didn't have a cell culture system to grow HIV. The key remaining practical needs are drug delivery to less developed nations, improving current therapy in determining whether a cure, that is no need for additional therapy, is possible, and of course, an effective vaccine. At the bottom of the slide is where I wish to go now, and that is the epidemic today. 
HIV deaths in 2007 were over 2 million. HIV deaths per month then were 175,000. Compare this to the tsunami death, which justifiably got a lot of publicity, of around 200,000 people. Consequently, we can say that there's a tsunami every month due to HIV deaths worldwide. This is an astronomical figure that is still continuing. Well, this, it, this tells what everybody knows. Just look at green, and this is sub-Saharan Africa. You see it makes up the vast majority. But Asia sort of rises, and the slope in Asia may be a little higher than the continuing slope of Africa in terms of new infections. I want to tell you briefly about the PEPFAR program because it's a proud and perhaps one of the few proud moments of the past administration. And this is supported by both Democrats and Republicans in the United States, and President Obama is intensifying it. It's the President's emergency program for AIDS relief, integrating public health and clinical medicine in resource-limited settings. Our institute, the Institute of Human Virology in Baltimore, is fortunate to have two very large grants from PEPFAR and is involved in the therapy, care, education of a great number of people in Africa. Indeed, we make up approximately 10 percent of the people treated in the PEPFAR program, and that's the bulk of people treated in Africa today. So the PEPFAR program began as $15 billion to 10 nations over five years for training, for treatment, et cetera. And it's now being increased to $50 billion. And you can see the sites in Africa where our institute is involved. Most of these sites are the places where my clinical colleague, Dr. Robert Redfield, has established sites, one of the recipients of the large PEPFAR grant. It turns out to be nine countries, seven in Africa, and one in the, two in the Caribbean, Haiti and Guyana. There's also a very big site in Nigeria headed by the head of our epidemiology and public health division, William Blattner. The number of individuals receiving care services in PEPFAR is 15 focused countries. That means outside of what we do is approximately 10 million by last year. And our involvement in therapy plus care is approximately now 1 million. This slide shows the progress in scaling up therapy in select countries between 2004 to 2007. Namibia, on your far left, looks rather good, up to 90 percent from 20 percent. So industrialized nations have really given help in Namibia itself in making a major, rather dramatic change. But if you go to the far right, you can see that therapy is still reaching only about 20 percent started off as virtually no one between Nigeria, Vietnam, Angola, Mozambique, for example. Well, we're intensively in Nigeria, so we're up to, what, about 25 percent or so there? But really, this was from virtually nothing, and it's going to be much more. This is where my colleague Bill Blattner is currently has locations. This is 2005 when he started. This is 2006. This is 2007. Now the next slide gives the total of what's going on. In blue are training centers. In squares are so-called hub sites. In circles with red dots are where therapy is given. And mother-to-child transmission sites are with just red dots. Some of these places are only mother-to-child transmission places where, great, where considerable progress is being made. These studies proved that Africans will not only be, can be very well trained in these countries, that the people, the patients, follow what they're supposed to do as well as they do in Baltimore, Maryland. So it's not true that this can't be done in Africa. It's a success, the therapy, up to now, and it's going to be more successful. But what is failing is prevention. We have made no dent with education. We've come to learn long ago in America and in Europe, for example, that education is, of course, necessary, but it's insufficient by far to solve this problem. 
Yeah, now this one I have, I don't have a slide of Dr. Redfield and colleagues because he doesn't do it that way, and, but I do have a slide of Dr. Blattner, of course, he's the one in the center, of course, and with colleagues in Nigeria. Now that's uh, the first part of what I wanted to speak about today, getting drugs to developing nations. Can we do more? Yes, America can do more. Certainly Europe can do, in my opinion, much more. And we need help from all industrial nations uh, because one idea is that what if vaccine turns out to be impossible, the only hope left is microbicide. I don't personally think that's going to work, although I may be in the minority. But other people want to give therapy to everyone, lower the amount of infection in the population, and get rid of the epidemic that way. This will take enormous testing. Because one of the reasons you have a big problem in Africa, one of the reasons, is they don't have testing anywhere near as much as we do in the industrial world. Therefore, much more blood transmission, sexual transmission. An example now to go to the next subject of pursuing better therapy. The Institute doesn't say it doesn't want to get a cure, but you know, you've got so many hands and so many ideas. And I personally believe that people who talk about a cure, and there's been one reported case, will get a headline. But how feasible will it be for Africa? And, and, and for my money, you don't prove you have a cure by saying you can't find virus in the individual. You have to wait till that person is not alive and do a post-mortem and search for sequences with PCR in every tissue. What we have decided to do and this is mainly Bob Redfield, our clinical director again, and myself that started this program, is try to make current drugs better. A long time ago when I was at NIH, at the National Cancer Institute, I thought, you know, soon we will run out of fuel by targeting viral proteins. Why can't we target cellular proteins? Because all viruses need a lot of different cellular proteins to replicate. Maybe we can find some the virus needs more than the cell and have a window of opportunity without so much toxicity. And we published some papers on that. And this is an example of a collaboration with Bob Redfield, but he has really pushed this approach. But I have to say, in the end, we don't have it in clinical trials, and it's almost hard to explain. The story goes back to a paper we published, my colleagues and myself, in 1995. And that was the identification of the first natural inhibitors of HIV, Rantes, MIP1-alpha, MIP1-beta. Those three beta chemokines, a subfamily of the cytokine family, are mainly important in human biology for helping to move cells from one site to another. You will all know, and there are posters even today, talking about the chemokine receptors, like you know, a whole bunch of them that the chemokines bind to. But those receptors form homing molecules for metastatic cancer cells. If they have the right surface molecule, they can find the chemokine receptor. Cancer cells can go to certain target sites. But this is not the subject of this talk. We showed they inhibit HIV. We showed it, it was in an early phase of the infection. And as we were moving to Baltimore, Ed Berger of NIH, and followed by others, uh, uh, kind of, well, Ed Berger independently showed that there was a, a certain chemokine receptor called CXCR4 as a, re, as a second receptor for HIV. But CCR5 became obvious then. We had shown it blocks HIV at the beginning of the infection. They knew CXCR4 was the second receptor. What about CCR5 and CCR5? Is the main second receptor. And it is the receptor that starts all infections almost. Maybe all. In other words, HIV usually needs CD4 to hook on to the cell. But to enter the cell and to start infection, it needs CCR5. And often, almost always, will go through CCR5. This slide shows a picture of the HIV entry process. In the absence of a pointer, I'll just describe it with you. On the far left shows the virus in yellow with the envelope in brown and the outer part of the envelope, GP120. It shows the GP120 sticking to the surface of the cell by binding CD4, this important cell surface molecule of CD4 T cells, also on the surface of macrophage, for example. 
Once in that bound form, the GP120 changes shape, here shown simply as the molecule blowing up like a balloon. If you look in the middle, the GP120 is bigger and altered. And that's just the schematic way of showing it's a major conformational change needed for it to find CCR5, that seven transmembrane receptor. Once it finds CCR5, GP41 in darker brown has, a, has that portion that can penetrate the cell membrane, pulling the virus cell membrane, excuse me, the virus membrane to the cell membrane, allowing fusion events and infection. So the chemokines work at the first step blocking CCR5 by binding to it and or, and or causing internalization of CCR5 so you no longer have that molecule for infection. That's how the chemokines work. But now let's think about this. CCR5 is a must, and it is the only second receptor for clade C, the dominant virus of Africa. What if you could reduce CCR5? Well, you already know that other people have reported years ago that a mutation in CCR5 in an otherwise healthy person causes no abnormalities as far as anybody knows. But those people, if they have double mutations from papa and mama, are protected against infection. We also know that more Nordic people have this mutation and are more protected from this way and by this way than people of the South, and Africans virtually don't have it at all. Now, there are many genetic ways you can have protection against HIV that are being identified now, so that there's not really a black and white story in more ways than one. So the black population may have more of this and the white population less of that, et cetera, so you tend to equalize it. But a small percentage of people seem to be protected against infection or if infected, will progress very, very slowly toward AIDS. And there are, again, lots of genetics involved. Nothing more important than if you're born with mutated CCR5, or if you have only one allele instead of two. One is damaged, the other is not. That means if you, you can get infected, but you progress much slower. But what if you're genetically prone to make more beta chemokines, or you're in an environment like a prostitute who didn't get infected in Kenya, but who's exposed to lots of other infections and locally in the vaginal tract would have a lot of production of beta chemokines that block infection. Yeah, you can get production that way too. This is an example of work we carried out a long time ago. When I first came to Baltimore, we collaborated with a Dr. Margolik at Johns Hopkins who had these samples stored. This is the production of one of the beta chemokines, MIP1-alpha. Note on the far right, HIV-positive people hardly produce anything. An HIV-positive person, however, who hasn't progressed to AIDS makes more. Look at the far left and you see a typical person, healthy heterosexual. Now look in the middle, which is the only interesting data in white, when you see this very large level of MIP1-alpha production. These are people that are normal, healthy, uninfected, but partners having risky sex with the people in blue on the, to the right side, the positives, but without yet AIDS. In other words, there's a correlation, and we showed it in multiple systems, of the production of beta chemokines and protection or slow progression. We showed it with hemophiliacs. Today, it's being rediscovered by geneticists, Ahuja, Steve O'Brien and others in America have shown that if you have genes that are, let's say, there's a polymorphism for the promoter for one of the beta chemokines called Rantes, R-A-N-T-E-S, then you express more Rantes, you have more protection, et cetera. So this, there's a little argument about this, and there are many other studies clinically that support it. When we call R5 HIV-1, we mean HIV that uses CCR5 as opposed to CXCR4, which is only in late stages or not at all. But you begin infection once again with CCR5, and it's mainly expressed when a T cell is activated. An activated CD4 memory T cell is its main target. So it tells you one reason why people in Africa exposed to all kinds of agents have a higher incidence of infection. 
because the T cells being activated have more receptors for CCR5. There are other biochemical mechanisms involved that would tend to say you'll be infected easier and spread more if you have lots of activation. High levels of CCR5 are found in advanced infection. CCR5 expression predicts disease progression, work of a Dutch group back in 2003, and shown on this slide. If you look at the top, that's a marker of activation of T cells, and you can see that the percent CD4, or disease, is at its worst, or disease at its highest, towards the left, towards the highest amount of activation. On the right, uh, excuse me, below, shows that CCR5 expression correlates with activation above, and that the more CCR5, the more disease progression to the left. Now we can have a strategy to block CCR5 with an antagonist or an antibody, a drug or an antibody, or actually target its expression, which would also do the same thing. Or we could augment production of beta chemokines, or we could do all of the above, and have. This is a slide from one of the first experiments carried out in the United States with an antagonist of CCR5, coming from Shearing Plow, a clinical study done by Bob Redfield and his colleague, Charlie Davis. If you look in green, you can see monotherapy, not triple drug, the dramatic decline in virus. With a washout on around day 20, 25, you can see the virus, day 20 actually, you can see the virus returning. However, the pharmaceutical industry turned a little bit away from this approach, with the exception of a couple of companies still involved. And the reason that sharing plow got away from it was toxicity of and resistance of HIV to CCR5 antagonists, limiting their use. The approach we made was to facilitate the use of much lower amounts of these antagonists by reducing the amount of target by decreasing its expression. In other words, if you had a thousand molecules of CCR5 on the surface of the cell, you have a certain rate of infection, a certain ability to infect. But if you reduce a thousand molecules of CCR5 to 10, infection is much harder. So we know that CCR5 is expressed in activated T cells and is not found in resting cells shown at, um, what is that, 10 o'clock? If you look at the cell cycle, or you can inhibit the cell cycle by various drugs at various stages, but it is only drugs that work in the latter part of G1 as you're approaching S phase, like rapamycin, like hydroxyurea, like a number of other drugs that I won't get into. They block at the time interleukin-2 and its receptor are being activated. Well, I don't want to get into details in rapamycin. There won't be time, but this slide shows the use of rapamycin, blocking expression shown at the top with northern blots of CCR5 gene, gene, and at the bottom, the protein with different concentration of rapamycin. So the conclusion at the bottom is that rapamycin inhibits CCR5, RNA, and protein. And it inhibits viruses that use CCR5 as anticipated, shown in this slide. BAL is a very uh, R5 virus utilizing CCR5, and you can see that rapamycin works very well on it, whereas 3B is X4, doesn't work at all, examples. We also showed that it works in vivo in monkeys. So rapamycin downregulates CCR5 in cinemologous macaques. You see in weeks blood PBMCs, and you see the decline in three different macaques uh, in virus at the end. At 12 weeks, or 10 weeks rather, rapamycin is discontinued as you see on the top. And you can see the virus starting to return. Now, does rapamycin potentiate the antiviral activity of entry inhibitors? The answer is yes, or I wouldn't be talking about it. So first with CCR5 antagonists, uh, we're using another one called TAC779 because Shering Plow wouldn't give us any more drug for whatever reason. Uh, and they didn't want these studies to be done but it worked very nicely. I won't show you what's on the bottom. It's, it's a synergy with antibodies, but I'll show you a, an inhibitor of fusion down the, uh, at the end of the um, steps needing for HIV to start infection. 
is the final fusion of membrane to membrane, and there's a drug that interferes with that called Fusion, or T20, and it's not intuitively obvious that it would also synergize with that, but when you think about it, if you allow more time for the drug to work by slowing virus infection, by having less CCR5, then it should work, and it does. First with TAC779, an antagonist of CCR5. The bottom shows different concentrations of rapamycin, and the top shows antiviral effect of rapamycin. TAC at 0.1 nanomolar without rapamycin is at the level of 10 to the 5. With rapamycin, you can see you're down all the way to 10 to the 2, multi-logarithmic drop and synergism. With T20, which I already told you that the, excuse me, that with high CCR5, look in the middle, you have faster effusion, shorter window. You need a lot of T20. With low CCR5, slower fusion event, longer window. You don't need much T20, and that too is true. The CCR5 density level on a donor's CD4 T cells, in this audience, all of you will vary. And you can show, even in people not infected, this variation, and it correlates to your susceptibility to uh, HIV and correlates with rapamycin being able to synergize with a fusion inhibitor. And this is an example of the, f the fusion inhibitor Fusion, or T20, um, with and without rapamycin. And you can see the synergy again, both with um, colors in a cell assay or with figure showing concentration. This was unexpected, however. Rapamycin delays uh, greatly the emergence of resistant viruses when using Fusion. Now, is Fusion ever used today? Yes. It's used when people run out of gas with oral tablet treatment. In other words, uh, kind of salvage. And this isn't something you inject. But now let's look at the slide carefully. With no drug control, blue, 100%. Now you look at the people treated with, rapam with uh, T20. That's green. And if you look at the left of the slide, you'll see that it really suppresses virus. But look at the emergence of the resistance very rapidly so that by day 80, you're really even above the control. You can look at what rapamycin itself does in red, but now look at rapamycin with T20 in purple. And purple stays flat. Resistance doesn't occur, and we followed it for 150 days in culture. The conclusion is that rapamycin downregulates CCR5, inhibits our 5 hiv one at drug concentrations that are not immunosuppressive. Because many of you will know that rapamycin is sometimes used to suppress the immune system. But this is substantially lower than those amounts. It synergizes with CCR5 antagonists and with fusion inhibitors against these viruses. And it delays emergence of resistance to Fusion T20. Um, the last thing is obvious. We would like to bring it to the clinic. It's never been in clinical trials. Isaac is telling me that I bet I'm out of time, but you don't mind staying another five minutes to hear about vaccine. Don't worry, Isaac. That's, we'll, we'll be okay. I'll keep the other talks shorter. <laughs> no, my coworkers at a IHV at this were Bob Redfield, our clinical director, Alonzo Heredia, a research associate from Spain, Olga Latinovic, a research associate from uh, Serbia. Okay, I really do want to make, I will make this fast, Isaac, and that's a statement about vaccines. HIV vaccine is a problem, everybody knows it. So what's been, you know, and you could read why it's a problem. People generally say it's the variation. I think that problem has been virtually solved in our institute. But for me, what's the problem is that it's a retrovirus. It integrates, there's no time for recalling an immune response. Measles, you get infected, you wait a week or so for memory, you clear the virus, you don't get polio. I mean, I, I was talking about polio, not measles, pardon me. Now, if you go to HIV, it's integrated within two days. There's no time to wait for an immune response, in my judgment. So that's a big problem. Okay, so you really need something that lasts. Now, people began with using envelope. Proper idea, I would say, is to use envelope. We have argued that a successful preventive vaccine 
must come close to sterilizing immunity, and to do so re would require an antibody-based vaccine, and you would be targeting the envelope. But the first people who targeted the envelope, and only people, did a big clinical trial and raised several hundred million dollars. And of course they failed. They failed miserably. Why? They just used envelope from a, from a lab strain that we had actually sent Genentech. Pure unadulterated envelope yields antibodies that give type-specific immunity. That's the problem. You only have an immune response effective against the very virus you use to make the vaccine, but not even to a relative. So you don't have any breadth. So the field jumped to cell-mediated immune vaccines, which don't block at entry. Your infection occurs. The argument is we'll lower the amount of virus, prevent the person from getting AIDS. The problem is that variants emerge within a year or less, and you do eventually do get AIDS. All these trials have failed. So I've already said what this slide says, so I'm going right to the point. Um, HIV GP120 interaction with CCR5 suggested an approach to us for preventive vaccine. The interacting portion of GP120 with CCR5 is conserved, and you need it to begin infection of virtually every HIV isolate. Let's look one last time on this slide, and then I'll come and show you the results in a couple of slides, and we're done. The, this goes through the steps of virus infection again. On the left, GP120 is seen to soon bind to CD4, the binding region, D1, D2. Then you see the morphological change in GP120, where the circle becomes a trapezoid just for schematic purposes, allowing it to interact with CCR5 and begin the fusion event soon thereafter. Our vaccine approach is to take this mobile envelope, which is covered with carbohydrate, to protect these key sites so the virus survives. And also, this region of the virus is internal. Antibodies can't get it until it opens when it's binding or getting close to CCR5 after binding CD4. What if we could fix the envelope like this, exposing that site by using as the vaccine GP120 coupled with the binding region D1, D2 of CD4, an approach John Gershoni contributed to when he worked with us in the late 1980s or beginning of 90s, and my colleague Tony DeVico contributed to, and we've been pushing this for some time. So GP120. D1, D2 of CD4, a linker, so they properly fold in time of neutral amino acids. Um, and we've done this with human in the middle, and we've done it with rhesus to have a homologous system because we're going to challenge rhesus. Here's the experiment. Compare groups three and five for time's sake. A naive control number five versus the candidate vaccine, which is, again is GP120 from rhesus macaque, um, no, from human, bowel, HIV, but rhesus macaque, D1, D2 of CD4, and the naive control is group 5. And this is the vaccine protocol, zero time, week 4, 24, 115, 119, take a lot of blood samples. You challenge at week 119 with a heterologous challenge. We've done that with multiple heterologous challenges. Homologous challenges mean nothing to me anyway. And here are the results. Compare the naive, which is the middle bottom, or the second one at the bottom, to what's next to it. You see the naive all remain infected. But look to the left of it, you see rhesus full-length single chain at the bottom left. And you see that we didn't get the expected result to block at entry. But what we did get is protection eventually in all of them. Most interesting, if you look at the bottom, when the animals were sacrificed long a time later, nine months after all these experiments were done, you look at the rhesus full-length single-chain results, and we found by PCR sequences in none of three out of four animals, and the one we found sequences was only in pooled lymph nodes. Now, how did we get this protection ultimately? No virus in plasma, hardly anything found in most animals' tissues. And the answer is we don't know, but we think it's from antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, ADCC. So what happens, we don't block entry, but we quickly kill cells after infection. And this correlates, the, 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 the protection correlated with induction of specific kinds of antibodies that neutralize virus, but only the, the, the interaction is with GP120 only in, it, when it has been exposed to CD4. In other words, with a new shape of GP120. And we believe that's blocking where 
it interacts with CCR5, but not so efficiently, but can kill those cells soon thereafter. So in conclusion, our first primate results were very interesting and suggestive an effect of these particular antibodies. We completed a second study, it wasn't just now, supported the first. We are involved in a fourth trial now with Gates, a bigger, much bigger one. A third trial failed, it was not impressive. And we think it's because like all envelope-based immunogens, the human response was not sustained, only three to four months. So when we, the third approach was with low dose and continued challenge done in collaboration with Wyeth. In other words, instead of one challenge with a large dose, you keep challenging over and over. And when you keep challenging over and over, you run out of the antibodies, you're no longer protected. Okay, and then the co-workers, George Lewis, Tony DeVico, Tim Fouts, collaborators, John Grishoni and Rajat Paul. And my final slide, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to and great affection for the Israeli people in general, Israeli scientists in particular, over 35 years I've been coming here. I have no better relations anywhere on earth. I wish you all the peace and happiness you so richly deserve by bringing so much to world history, period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gallo. I think this uh, brilliant lecture illustrates more than anything else, why Bob Gallo won the Dan David Prize. Just to remind you, he won it for the discovery of IL-2, for the discovery that uh, HTLV-1 and HTLV-2, two retroviruses for the first time, uh, uh, cause a, a human cancer, and the uh, third um, item for which he got the prize was the development of the blood test for AIDS. I, I think there is no person more deserving for such a prize than he is, and this prize, as well as the 28 uh, uh, honorary doctorates that he has and numerous international prizes, uh, really shows what type of a great scientist he is. Thank you very much. Thank you. We go on now with our program. Uh, again, uh, there will be two uh, doctoral students now, and then we'll end the program uh, by a lecture from a senior scientist, Professor John Gershoni, um, from uh, our department. Anyway, the next speaker is Ronnie Scherzer, a graduate student um, uh, at the Faculty of Life Sciences, uh, who will be talking about inhibiting beta myeloid aggregation from in vitro to in vivo, again, a public health problem of neurodegenerative uh, disease. Ronnie. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for uh, the organizers of this committee for letting me speak in this uh, very honorable symposium. Uh, what I, I will be talking about today is uh, inhibiting uh, beta amyloid aggregation from in vitro to in vivo in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so a little bit of history about Alzheimer's disease. So in 1901, a 51-year-old woman named Augusta D. was admitted to a state's hospital in Frankfurt. And a few years later, Augusta had died and her brain was delivered to Dr. Aloy Alzheimer for examination. A few years later, the term Alzheimer was coined. And it was only that in 1980 that the two main uh, proteins associated with this disease were actually identified. And only in 1983 was the first drug specifically for the treating of symptoms of this disease was approved by the FDA. So a few facts and statistics about Alzheimer's. So uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most frequent type of dementia in, uh, in elderly. Around 2% of the total populations in the ages between 65 and 74 are diagnosed with this disease. Around 19% of the total population of the ages between 75 and 84, and around 42% of the total population of the ages over 85. And a small fact that was uh, uh, appointed about two years ago by the Alzheimer's Association, 4.5 million Americans and 24 million people worldwide suffer from this disease. 
So these figures are projected to triple, to nearly triple by 2050 due to the aging of the population of the developed world. Now the total financial cost of the treatment of Alzheimer's disease is around $148 billion every year. So Alzheimer's disease can be classified into two dis uh, distinct cases. Uh, the first is the sporadic Alzheimer, which is the most common form of Alzheimer. And the second is the early onset Alzheimer's disease. Now this is a disease that is diagnosed uh, before the ages of 65. It is a very uncommon form of the disease. Only 5 to 10 percent of all Alzheimer cases are in fact uh, um, uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease. About 50% of all early onset, uh, onset Alzheimer's disease are in fact familial or uh, genetic form of this disease. So um, Alzheimer can be uh, characterized as progressive decline in cognitive function, uh, in short and long-term memory loss, in language deterioration, impaired ability to process uh, visual information, delusional thinking, poor judgment, and many other symptoms. So when we look at the, at the brains of uh, patients who have died from Alzheimer's and we look at their brain post-mortem, what we see is a large amount of aggregations of proteins inside and outside of the nerve cells. Now we can also see a large decline in brain mass and a large amount of neuronal death. And as I mentioned before, there are two proteins which are uh, mostly associated with this disease. Uh, the first is tau, which uh, accumulates and aggregates uh, as a neurofibular uh, toxic species, which I will not be talking about today. And the second is uh, A beta, which is, um, or amyloid beta, which uh, uh, aggregates as large amyloid fibers and deposits, which is actually the focus of my talk. So what is A beta or uh, amyloid beta? Uh, A beta is a small peptide. It's around 39 to 42 amino acids long. The 42 amino acid one being the most aggregative and the most toxic. And it is derived from a much larger protein called uh, APP. So APP is an amyloid precursor protein, and this is an integral transmembr uh, transmembranal glycoprotein, and it accumulates in uh, synapses and neurons. But the primary function of this, uh, this uh, protein, this large protein, is not yet known, though it is known to have some sort of uh, uh, a function in the formation, and, uh, uh, formation of synapses and neuronal plasticity. So what are these amyloids that I've been talking about? So uh, amyloids are these large, uh, filamentous, are large filamentous proteins. They range in size from uh, nanometers to microns, and they are composed largely of a large amount of beta sheets, and they have a typical X-ray diffraction pattern, which you see here, I don't have a, right here on the bottom, <laughs> on the bottom of the slide is an electron uh, microscope uh, figure of how these uh, amyloids look like a spaghetti bundle. This is what we see in electron microscope when we look at a large amount of amyloids. And um, amyloids are formed by a self-assembly process of uh, different proteins, where a single monomer of the protein sticks to one another and eventually forming this large uh, amyloid fiber. So what you, hear, what you see here in the slide at the top is actually uh, the, uh, a small schematic diagram of how these amyloids are formed. So we have uh, our monomer. In our case, we're talking about an uh, A-beta monomer, which actually uh, uh, unfolds into a wrong conformation, which is high in beta sheets. From here, one monomer sticks to another monomer and in turn grows into uh, oligomers, and from here, uh, finally, into this large and mature uh, fibril. So amyloids are key events in diverse diseases, not only in Alzheimer's, but also in diabetes type 2, in uh, Parkinson's disease, in Prion's disease, and many others. But what's very interesting about these proteins, which are associated with different diseases, is that if we look at the amino acid uh, sequence of these different proteins, we see that there's no homology in amino acid sequence between each one of the peptides that is reliable for each one of the different diseases. So what you see here is uh, on the top is actually uh, short peptide fragments of different uh, proteins and peptides which are able, um, which are associated with different amyloidogenic diseases. These small peptides are themselves capable of forming uh, these amyloid structures. Now, if we look at them, it is very obvious that there's no, uh, no, uh, um, no homology between amino acid sequence. But what we can see, and is underlined in black, is a large amount of uh, aromatic amino acids. So as most of you might know or not know, uh, a large amount of aromatic amino acids in peptides and proteins is very uncommon. So from here was raised a theory by my supervisor, Professor Eud Gazit, which stated that aromatic uh, amino acids play uh, a strong role in the formation and the stabilization of uh, these amyloid fibers. And more often, they serve as the key recognition motif between each one of the monomers. OK, so from here uh, started uh, my, uh, my part of the, um, of the research. And what we are trying to find in our lab is uh, small aromatic molecules 
which will in turn bind this uh, molecular aromatic recognition motif and eventually uh, inhibit the self-assembly of A-beta into these uh, large toxic aggregates. Now, in the last few years, there's been several debates in the literature whether or not it really is these toxic amyloid fibers or whether it is prior soluble oligomers that are the exact uh, toxic species of this disease. So for this reason, we would like to tackle this problem in inhibiting the self-assembly already at early stages of the self-assembly and in this way inhibit the oligomers as well as the fibrils. Okay, so the molecules that I will be presenting to you today are actually a, a two aromatic compound, a two aromatic component uh, compound, uh, which is actually formed from two different uh, aromatic uh, groups. The first is a quinone, and uh, what are quinones? As you see above, you have different, we, we have different forms of quinones. We have the benzoquinone, the naphtoquinone, and the anthroquinone. I will be focusing on uh, naphtoquinone derived molecules, which are uh, squared here in blue. Uh, so naphtoquinones are, uh, are, are one aromatic, um, one aromatic, uh, resi uh, one aromatic uh, ring, which is fused to a non-aromatic ring with two carbonylic uh, uh, bonds. So you might ask, why quinones? Well, first of all, quinones are small aromatic molecules, and they have some sort of a functional isometry, which is interesting to us. They're very easy and very cheap to synthesize. And furthermore, a variety of quinones are known to act as inhibitors of various metabolic pathways in the cells. And both natural and designed synthetic quinones are known as, to serve as antibacterial, antiviral, and also anti-cancerous. And furthermore than that, there's one, anthra, one quinone, which is called dantroquinone, which is actually an anthroquinone, and it is known to reduce uh, neurotoxicity and related to uh, beta amyloid proteins. So the second part of our molecule, which is linked to the quinone, is the tryptophan residue. So you might ask me why tryptophan? So several years ago, we have shown in our lab that uh, the tryptophan amino acid is a, re uh, is a central recognition motif for the amyloid formation of IAPP, which is a, a polypeptide associated with the formation of amyloids in diabetes type 2. We had also shown uh, a few years ago that uh, indole and uh, tryptophan molecules can, in fact, inhibit the formation of amyloid fibrils. And the most recent results, which was uh, derived by my colleague, which is sitting here in the audience, Nat Friedman, uh, which showed that uh, uh, tryptophan-derived uh, D-peptide can uh, completely block the self-assembly of this beta-amyloid peptide and, moreover, completely recover the cognitive performance of Alzheimer's disease-modeled mice. Okay, so these are our two lead compounds. I will name them NQ-TRIP and chlor-NQ-TRIP. And uh, I, most of my study, uh, most of what I will present to you uh, today is, about, is, is the results from NQ-TRIP, and at the end I will also show some results from uh, chlor-NQ-TRIP, simply because the NQ-TRIP was a little bit better. So the first essay we wanted to check was whether or not uh, NQ-TRIP actually inhibits these uh, aggregates. These aggregates that have been known in the literature to be the toxic aggregates. They, they have been termed in the literature as the 56 star. And uh, utilizing a protocol by uh, healing co-workers, we are actually able, after a 24-hour incubation, to get these SDS-stable oligomers. And we wanted to see if our compound, in fact, inhibits these oligomers. So we incubated from the monomeric stage A beta with our compound, and we saw that at different concentrations we get a complete, uh, a complete inhibition of this toxic oligomer, even at very low concentrations. And at high concentration, we get a complete deletion of this oligomeric species. We next wanted to see, of course, if NQ-TRIP also inhibits this fibril formation. So for this, we use the THT fluorescence assay. Uh, this is a very common assay used in our lab. Uh, THT is a small aromatic molecule which binds these, uh, structural, uh, these structured amyloid proteins. And uh, once it binds, it has a strong shift in fluorescence. And it's very quantitative because the more fluorescence that is measured is exactly uh, proportional to the amount of amyloids that we have in the test tube. So high fluorescence, high, uh, high amount of amyloids, low fluorescence, low amount of amyloids. So we can see that we, um, we incubated our compound uh, at the monomeric stage of A-beta, and we followed it in the course of 270 hours. And we can see that at different concentrations, we get a complete delete of these amyloid formations. And after that, we took it to electron microscope, and we can see here on the bottom that, uh, in fact, uh, there's, uh, there's almost a complete deletion of these amyloid fibers. What we do see sometimes, but very rare, is little tiny uh, short amyloid structures, but very small and with a very different morphology than uh, our wild type A beta. So we also wanted to know exactly what is the affinity constants between our compound and uh, A beta. So for this, we used the intrinsic fluorescence of our tryptophan tryptophanic compound, and we could titrate this compound into uh, A beta, and using anisotropic fluorescence, we could actually calculate this affinity constant, a very high uh, 90 nanomolar. So affinity is very, very strong between this compound and A beta. 
So we also wanted to, figure, to understand more of where exactly this compound binds in, uh, in the A-beta peptide. For this, we turned to the lab of, uh, of Dr. Debbie Shalev in uh, Jerusalem, where we did uh, NMR uh, spectroscopy studies. And what we wanted to see is where, the where is the strongest chemical shift deviation in A-beta in the different residues of A-beta when we incubated with NQ-trip. And we saw that there are three uh, amino acids which, uh, which show the largest chemical shift deviation. So we got kind of a hint that this is probably where our compound binds. And this was very happy to us because this made us very happy because uh, one of our hypotheses was that, in fact, NQ-trip would, uh, would bind one of the aromatic amino acids, and it did, the phenylalanine 20. And it also bind, uh, bind alanine 21 and glutamic acid 22. So to get a more uh, understanding on this uh, structure, we went to uh, in silico uh, computer analysis. And, and, and to do this, we, uh, we um, went to a group from Switzerland uh, uh, in, with Professor uh, uh, Kiflisch. And what uh, you see here in front of you are the four, uh, the four most common conformations of the binding between uh, our molecule and A-beta. What you see here is that nq trip seems to be uh, binding either uh, by hydrogen bonds, the peptide, the peptide backbone of either alanine 21, phenylalanine 20, or glutamic acid 22, and, and the uh, tryptophan and quinone rings seem to be sandwiching or clamping uh, either phenylalanine 20 or phenylalanine 19, which was very, uh, very happy for us to, uh, to, to learn because this is exactly what we thought, that this would be the core recognition motif and where our compound would bind. Okay, so we next wanted to see whether or not our compound is toxic to PC12 cells, so we incubated it with different concentrations uh, on PC12 cells, and we saw that there's no toxic, no toxic, um, it is non-toxic whatsoever. But what we did see is that nq trip does, in fact, have a protective effect against the toxicity of A-beta to these PC12 cells. Okay, so after we got these promising in vitro results, we wanted to see if our compound actually works in a more complex in vivo uh, system. So we first went to the lab of uh, Professor uh, Daniel Segal and uh, collaborated with his uh, Drosophila model of Alzheimer's disease, and we wanted to uh, we wanted to see if it does uh, if our compound does uh, does does uh, have some sort of an effect on these uh, Drosophila flies. So the Drosophila flies that we used are Drosophila flies which overexpress A beta uh, 42 in their uh, nervous system, and we based our results on an article that was published uh, in 2005 by Crother and co-workers where they showed two distinct phenotypes of these sick Alzheimer flies. The first is a problem and a defect in their locomotive behavior. The, the flies simply are aging faster and do not have the energy to climb to the top of the test tube. And the second is a defect in survival. So we separated our flies into four groups. Two groups, which are our, uh, two groups which are our control groups, one grown on, uh, on, uh, on regular fly food and one grown on fly food that we cooked inside the fly food, this is our compound. And our two sick groups, one that's feeding on regular food and, and the second group which is feeding on uh, food that into this food we, we uh, cooked our NQ trip compound. So they're actually feeding on this molecule. So what you see here is the results of our climbing behavior. If you look at day eight, you can see in dark gray our uh, sick female Alzheimer flies. And what you see is that only 10% of the flies could actually climb to the top of the test tube. What you see in black and in white are our two control groups, whether feeding on regular food or feeding on our uh, molecule. And in dashed black lines, you see our uh, sick female, which were actually fed with, uh, with this compound. And you see a complete reduction of this phenotype. And what you see here is exactly how it looks. On the left, you see our sick female. They're at the bottom of the test tubes, and they do not climb. On the right, you see our control. And in the middle, you see our female that were fed with our compound. And you can see that they are very happy climbing at the top of the test tube and very energetic. They look exactly like the controls. And what I'm presenting here is our survival essay. Uh, again, you can see in blue our female, uh, our female sick, uh, sick AD group of Drosophila flies. You can see that by day 15, already around 80% of the female are, had died and only 20% were left. And what you see in uh, beige is our control group and also in green, and also in green, our female that were fed with our compound. Two more minutes and I'm done. This is my last slide. What I would also like to show you is actually one of the most recent results that we have uh, with a collaboration with uh, Danny Frankel's lab. And this is uh, results from the other derivative, the chloro-NQ trip. So what we wanted to see is to see whether or not our compound does in fact uh, um, 
does in fact protect the, the uh, uh, behavior of mice, which are uh, our uh, transgenic AD model mice. We use the five familial Alzheimer's mutation uh, model of mice. So these mice at six months are already very, very sick, and you can see a problem in cognition. We went to the object recognition test in where you take the mouse and put him in a closed field with uh, an object. You let him explore and learn this object. And after a few days, you put a new object inside the field. Now, the, the healthy uh, mice are very curious, and they start to, uh, to look at the, new, uh, at the new object. And most of the time, they spent exploring the new object. But the sick mice do not explore this new object and are ambivalent to this object. And what you see here are our results. Uh, in black is our wild-type mice. They spend around 75% of their time next to the new object. In white uh, is our AD uh, mutated mice, our uh, sick mice. And in gray, you can see our mice that were injected with our compound. Now, we wanted to also check whether or not there is a reduction in, of this 56 kilo delta in the oligomer in the brains of these mice. And we did, in, uh, in fact, uh, sacrifice these mice. And we saw a 67% reduction of this toxic oligomer. So I'll run by the conclusions fast because I don't have time. I would just like to uh, thank my professor, Eud Gazit, and Professor Daniel Sega, and the collaboration uh, with Danny Frankel and uh, Professor Amadeo Kaflish and Debbie Shalev and all my lab, and especially to Anat, which helped me in every part of this work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Question? I think uh, we'll skip. I think we'll skip questions. You'll have a chance to see Ronnie during the uh, during the jazz music or the uh, sausages that will be given later on. Uh, I have the pleasure of calling Natalie Tarnovsky Freund from the Faculty of Life Sciences, who will talk, will come back to the uh, topic of HIV, and uh, will talk about epitope-based vaccines. Natalie? <clears throat> okay, so... Uh... I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this great opportunity to present my work here and also to thank uh, Professor Gallo for his uh, fascinating work and contribution to the AIDS research. And so my name is Natalie, and today I'll tell you about epitope-based vaccines, a new approach to vaccination based on the use of an isolated B-cell epitope as a subunit vaccine. In the second part of my talk, I will show you our preliminary results for applying this approach for the SARS coronavirus, and not HIV, sorry. So uh, I think there is no doubt that currently vaccination has been the greatest means to manage public health. The success of vaccines has saved hundreds of millions of people, and some pathogens, such as the poliovirus, have been uh, declared almost eradicated. The vaccine itself is kind of a training system for the body when it exposes us to a safe version of a dangerous pathogen. As a result, we developed what is called, what is called an immunological memory, memory T cells and memory B cells. Memory B cells subsequently lead to a massive production of antibodies, what have been what are the main focus of our laboratory. Just a second. Sorry. Excuse me. Okay, so neutralizing antibodies play a very important part during immune defense. These antibodies bind areas on the outer surface of the pathogen and therefore are able to block the infection in its very early stages. The areas on the outer surface of the pathogen that are recognized by these antibodies are defined as neutralizing epitopes. So what are these neutralizing epitopes? As one can imagine, these areas often play a crucial role in the pathogen's life cycle. For example, the receptor binding site or other sites that are responsible for membrane fusion. Because of their importance, the neutralizing epitopes cannot be mutated by the pathogen in any fashion and they are conserved throughout its evolution. Therefore, the pathogen ev evolved many strategies to hide the neutralizing epitopes in order to evade immune surveillance. For example, shielding with glycomoieties or hiding inside hydrophobic pockets in the center of the protein, making them not immunoaccessible. Or in some cases, such as in the case of uh, the HIV uh, CCR5 co-receptor, uh, these neutralizing epitopes are not do not exist in the context of the whole circulating pathogen, and they are formed de novo during specific stages of its life cycle. 
So the goal of this project is to expose the neutralizing epitopes in order to make them more immune accessible. Or in other words, the objective is to focus the immune response to the neutralizing epitopes in order to generate protective immunity. And there are several approaches to achieve this goal. One of them was, uh, um, you heard about it from Dr. Gallo, uh, by stabilizing the GP120, the envelope protein of HIV, in its uh, CD4 bound conformation in order to expose the CCR5 epitope. And there are numerous other approaches. But today I will tell you about our approach, which is to produce isolated neutralizing epitopes and use them as immunogens. And this approach is based on the underlying hypothesis that if we have the epitope of a neutralizing antibody, we can use this epitope as a vaccine, as an immunogen to elicit a neutralizing response. So we like to call this approach reverse immunology because our starting point here is a well-defined existing and accessible neutralizing antibody. I will not get into how you make these antibodies because this is certainly not an easy task. However, we all know that neutralizing antibodies exist, they exist in the lab, and we want to encourage the body to produce them. So once we have the antibody, we can use it as a spotlight to show us where the neutralizing epitope is. We are interested in the neutralizing epitope. So we have the antibody, we know what is the antigen, we can, f sorry, we can find the epitope. Once we found the epitope, uh, the next step is to reconstitute the epitope as an independent subunit outside the context of the whole antigen and afterwards use the reconstituted epitope as an immunogen to, uh, with, with the hope that it will be able to elicit a neutralizing immune response with the same characteristics as the original neutralizing antibody that we started with. So our research plan uh, is divided into three parts when the prerequisite is a neutralizing monoclonal antibody that is available. And the first part is to map the, antibody, the, the epitope. The second part is to reconstitute the epitope outside the original context of the protein where it is not immunogenic enough and it uh, is incapable to elicit a neutralizing response. And the third step is to immunize with the reconstituted epitope and see if we're actually getting something neutralizing. We have three model system, systems for this project, and today I will tell you about uh, one of them. This picture was taken in China seven years ago during the outbreak of the SARS epidemic, and today I will show you our first attempts to construct such an epitope-based vaccine for the virus that causes this disease, the SARS coronavirus. So here you can see the SARS coronavirus. It, is, uh, it causes respiratory failure, and you can see a schematic picture of the virus uh, on your left, uh, this is an enveloped RNA virus, and uh, um, it, it is comprised of several proteins. We will focus on the brown proteins, here shown in brown, the spikes, because the spike protein is the one that are, is responsible for the um, initial contact between the virus and the host cell. So as you may recall, the prerequisite for epitope-based vaccine construction is an available neutralizing monoclonal antibody. Such an antibody was developed in the laboratory of our collaborator, Professor Wayne Moresco, and was named ADR. ADR was the first antibody known to neutralize the SARS virus. It has very high affinity for the virus, and it protects animals when it is given prior to infection. The mechanism of neutralization was found to be binding to the spike protein and interruption the association between the spike and its cellular receptor. Therefore, it was considered as viral entry inhibitor. So here we have a really great antibody, which is also very efficient as passive vaccine. However, we want, we want to have an active vaccine. And for this, we want to take the epitope of ADR and use it as an immunogen in order to elicit an ADR-like antibody response. So the first question is, where is the epitope of ADR? And this is our step one, epitope mapping. How can one map the epitope of an antibody? The best way to map the epitope is to co-crystallize the antibody along with its antigen. However, crystallization is a challenging task, and sometimes generating high-resolution co-crystals can take years. Anyway, when we started working with ADR, we had no such co-crystal, so we had to take an alternative bioinformatic approach that was developed in our lab. So what we do in this approach, we take the antibody of interest, in our case ADR, and we screen it with a very large collection of random peptides. Very large is 10 to the 9th, a billion of different combinations of which we generally are able to isolate peptides that bind to our antibody specifically. Here you can see 10 affinity selected peptides from the ADR antibody. This is only a small sample. Uh, we have many more. 
and a comprehensive analysis of these peptides revealed no common homologous motif between them. Also, we were not able to align any one of these peptides to the primary sequence of the antigen, the receptor binding domain of the spike. This suggests that the epitope of ADR might be conformational. And the question now is how can we translate the information concealed within the affinity selected peptides in order to map the epitope of our antibody on the context of its antigen? And for this purpose, we developed a computer algorithm, MAPITOP, that was developed in a collaboration with Dr. Tal Pupko in our department in Tel Aviv University. And MAPITOP, what it does, it basically takes as an input the affinity selected peptides and the three dimensional structure of the antigen, and it returns an output of epitope prediction. So here in red, you can see the residues that were predicted to a contact ADR. And uh, we published this work, and several months after we published this work, the group of Robert Liddington uh, finally succeeded to generate a high resolution co crystal between ADR and the spike protein. So we had a chance to compare our results to the co-crystallization results. And here you can see the comparison. The red residues are the ones that were predicted uh, by MAPITOP. The blue residues are, uh, were predicted by co-crystal, uh, what we refer as the genuine epitope of ADR. And the green segment is where the prediction overlaps with the co-crystal. So we were very pleased with these results. And now we could continue to the next step, which is epitope reconstitution. Here you can see again the epitope of ADR. The blue residues are the ones that contact the antibody. And if you see some numbers, the whole antigen, the receptor binding domain of the spike is 193 amino acids. And the epitope, uh, the entire epitope is 32 uh, amino acids. So the epitope basically is only 16% out of the whole protein. What we intend to do is to increase the specific activity of our epitope by um, to focus a uh, on the epitope by increasing its specific activity. And therefore, we want to exclude all the non-neutralizing uh, other epitopes uh, in this molecule, or basically doing this. So now we have a new structure. However, if you synthesize this structure as a linear peptide, it will probably not fold on itself correctly. Why? It is, first, it's too large. It's nearly 60 amino acids. It's multi-segmented, and it's highly conformational. In fact, what we what we desire to, to achieve is the ideal epitope, the shortest recombinant peptide, which will contain the maximal contact residues, however, with the greatest stability. So we have here some kind of a trade-off. We are willing to give up some contacts if it makes the structure more stable. However, we cannot give up all the contacts because we have to maintain uh, the antibody binding. So in that point, we figured out that maybe looking on the crystal structure is not enough, and maybe we have to examine more the dynamics of our epitope. And we generated a new collaboration with uh, Dr. Yossit Svadia in the biochemistry department in our university. And we started to run molecular dynamics simulations. What is molecular dynamics? Molecular dynamics is a biophysical computational tool that examines the behavior of proteins in solutions over time. Generally, what it does, it takes uh, the protein and it places it in a virtual solution, a periodic box containing salt, ions, and water molecules. And afterwards, it simulates the interaction between all the atoms in the system over a period of time. So now I'll show you a short movie of a single simulation on the receptor binding domain. Please notice that the epitope area here is colored red, this segment. Let's see the movie. Let's hope that it works. Okay, so you can see, first of all, that the protein is mostly stable as a result of six beta strands that kind of anchor the whole thing together. Four of them are here, and two, two beta strands on top are part of the ADR epitope. And this is, they are very stable. The flexible part, the most significant movement in this molecule can be seen over here in the head of the structure, which is also part of the ADR epitope. When this head um, moves towards the betas and back, around uh, the hinge area over here. So the flexible element, the most significant movement, can also be seen in the ADR epitope area. So we selected these two, these two elements. We call them the rigid element and the flexible elements of our epitope. And these two elements looked important for, to us uh, to, for reconstitution. 
So we constructed the lead peptide. The lead peptide was four amino acids long, and it contained only 22 ADR binding contacts. Despite the fact that the lead peptide had 100% homology to the intact antigen of ADR, it showed only marginal binding to the antibody. And this really illustrates the complexity of our task. How can one stabilize a conformational epitope? How can one reconstitute a functional binding surface? As you imagine, we assume that the loss of binding was due to um, unstabilization of the epitope because the lead peptide showed an incorrect conformation of the ADR epitope, which was not recognized by the antibody. In order to overcome this obstacle, we developed a new concept, a concept of combinatorial libraries of conformers. We took the genuine segments, the genuine elements of the ADR epitope, the lead peptide, and we placed it in tens of thousands of different conformations by introducing a number of strategically positioned amino acids. Our rationale was that if we take the antibody and we present it with all possible conformations of its own epitope, we'll be able to isolate conformations that have the greatest resemblance to the genuine epitope of ADR, because they will be the only ones recognized by our antibody. So we constructed the libraries and we screened them with ADR. And here you can see one such experiment. This is a dot blot experiment when the nitrocellulose membrane was incubated with the ADR antibody. And every dot here represents a different epitope conformer. In the lower left, you can see the lead peptide. It shows no binding at all in these conditions. You can also see conformers that have mediocre or weak binding to ADR. However, the encouraging thing about this experiment is that we can see many black dots, and the black dots represent positive epitope conformers that are recognized by our antibody reasonably well. So to summarize the reconstitution results, we started with the receptor binding domain uh, of the spike protein, the intact antigen of ADR, which was 193 amino acids long and contained the entire epitope of ADR, 32 residues, and of course it was recognized by uh, ADR. However, we wanted to construct a better immunogen. We wanted to focus on the epitope area. So we ran molecular dynamic simulations, and we selected two elements that seemed important, and we constructed the lead peptide. The lead peptide was 40 amino acids long, contained only 22 binding contacts, and however, we lost antibody binding. So we assumed that the loss of binding was because the lead peptide showed an incorrect conformation of the epitope. So we constructed and screened combinatorial libraries of conformers, and we were able to select ADR binding conformers that were now 43 amino acids long, contained the same 22 contacts. However, we managed to reproduce antibody binding. So to summarize the whole talk, we proposed a new approach. Uh, by which one can take the, uh, the epitope of a known neutralizing antibody and use it as an immunogen to elicit a neutralizing response. In order to test this approach, we had to overcome two obstacles. The first one is to find the epitope. The second one is to reconstitute the epitope as a functional binding surface. In the first field of epitope mapping, we made a major progress when we, de we developed Mapitope, a computer algorithm um, that enables us to map epitopes without uh, being dependent on co-crystallization. In the second field of epitope reconstitution, we also have very encouraging preliminary results that show that by using molecular dynamic simulation, simulations and combinatorial libraries of conformers, we are able to isolate functional epitope conformers, short peptides that contain the reconstituted epitope and bind our antibody. So now we are in position to test the hypothesis. Do the epitope conformers of ADR elicit an ADR-like neutralizing immune response? And for this, we uh, intend to start some immunization studies, uh, and I hope that uh, I will be able to report some good news soon. So I'd like to thank uh, Professor Jonathan Gershoni, my mentor over here, for being an excellent scientist and a great teacher, and all the lab members for providing fun and uh, productive working environment and also our collaborators uh, here in Tau, Dr. Tal Pupko and uh, Dr. Yossi Tzfadia in their labs, and uh, our collaborators in Harvard, Professor Moresco, and our funders, and thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, again, because of, uh, we are behind, behind of time, uh, almost 20 minutes. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> we won't ask questions, and 
all those people that are interested in this very interesting lecture should approach Natalie um, after the lecture of our next lecturer, uh, Professor Jonathan Gershoni. I'm sure everybody knows him. Um, and he will also uh, talk about AIDS or vaccination in general and the title of his talk, Risks and Benefits of Vaccination. Johnny, please. Thank you very much to the organizers. It's a delight and pleasure to be here. Um, I actually will talk very little about AIDS per se. I want to address a question which I think is extremely important uh, to the general public in that over time there's an ever-increasing amount of lobbies and anti-vaccine activists that have over the time suggested that the vaccines may be very dangerous and therefore to some degree there are people who are abandoning such a valuable tool for the protection of public health. 1837, a steamboat is going up the Missouri River and uh, on its way to Fort Clark stops at an Indian village of the Mandan tribe. At the time there were about 2,000 people living in this village. Now when the boat docks, one of the clerks on the ship is already showing signs, clinical presentation of smallpox. And within two months, 2,000 Indians living in the village, their population dwindled to 138. So this illustrates the devastation of a disease such as smallpox. Smallpox in general, in the mid-1800s, killed 400,000 people a year, a year, in Europe. Just in 1921, there were 100,000 cases of smallpox in the United States. But surprisingly, in 1977 was the last case of smallpox in the world. So as Dr. Gallo, Bob, described emerging infectious diseases, SARS, AIDS, the threat of influenza, here we find ourselves describing what is in fact disappearing diseases, eradication of disease. And one asks, how does one in fact eradicate a disease? We know how to do this. And the answer is the use of vaccines. Vaccines basically work. And we've seen this repeated times. If we consider, generally speaking, that before vaccination in the United States, four million children were infected with measles and complications led to 3,000 deaths just from measles. Diphtheria killed 15,000 children a year in the United States. 15,000 adolescents usually. And German measles caused 20,000 births in the United States per year of children who were deformed, blind, deaf, and retarded. Introduction of vaccination has been the major tool for general public health and provides protection against what is in essence preventable diseases. Now how did this start? Well, historically many of you have already heard the story of Ed, Edward Jenner. Jenner was a physician in Gloucestershire, England, and he reasoned that the disease from an animal, from cowpox, could provide immunity, protection, against the devastating smallpox disease. And so, in 1796, Jenner inoculated the neighbor's son. Eight-year-old James Phipps was inoculated with cowpox, Dr. Jenner, he followed the progression of the disease. James Phipps developed a fever and the typical signs of cowpox. And when he was fully recuperated, at that point, Jenner then inoculated him with live infectious smallpox to see if, in fact, he was protected. And to his delight, he found that he was. However, was the inoculation with smallpox sufficiently efficient? And so in order to test it again, a few months later, he challenged him again. And he found, in fact, that inoculating with cowpox provides protection against the human disease, smallpox. Now this is, of course, uh, an experiment with some uh, 
uh, ethical questions. There was no informed consent. And so one wonders if this would be at all possible today, obviously not. But the fact remains was is that vaccination did prove to be extremely effective. And over the years, so much so that in 1967, the World Health Organization decided to engage and launch a massive vaccination program. A half a billion doses of smallpox vaccine were used to inoculate millions of people, over 27 countries, and since 1967 to 1977, in fact, smallpox was eradicated. The last case of smallpox, as I said, was in Somalia in 1977. So how does this work? So now I have to give you a crash course in basic immunology. Immunology basically works with the ability to distinguish us from them, what we refer to in immunology, self and non-self. But you're either with us or against us. And so here, in essence, we're trying to distinguish us from them. Now, when one is infected, subjected to a pathogen, dealing with that pathogen, successfully clearing the pathogen renders immunity. And this natural immunity is characterized by the fact that it's specific and long-lasting. So let me just concisely summarize this in the words of President Bush, and that is either you're with us or against us. And so this is what the immune system does. It recognizes those that we want to get rid of and knocks them out. Now, if that's immunology, now we have to discuss a bit vaccinology. Vaccinology is basically the boot camp for the immune system. It's a training system. We can take pathogens and we can render them harmless. We can make surrogate pathogens that are either killed virus or attenuated virus or just fractions of virus. And then use these to inoculate people and allow the people to learn how to inactivate the real thing. Now this immunity is actually gained at a much lesser price. You don't have to experience the disease, nor chance the ramification of severe complications. And so therefore, under the circumstances, a vaccine is a means to train the system with lesser cost and is perceived as being immunity without risk. Or does it have risk? And this is basically the question I want to deal with now, is to try to evaluate with you how safe or not are vaccines? And let me go back to what has been mentioned a number of times. In reality, the uh, epidemic of polio in the United States in 1916, 9,000 people were paralyzed by polio in the city of New York alone. And over 2,000 were killed by this devastating virus. Most notably, in 1921, FDR contracted polio. And so it's not surprising that for his birthday, June, January 30th, 1934, the first year of him being president of the United States, he initiated what is referred to as the president's birthday ball. 6,000 balls, wonderful parties were initiated in 4,000 cities throughout the United States, in the words of President Roosevelt, to dance so that others may walk. And these balls were set up to raise very substantial funds to do the research for polio. And in fact, as a result of this effort, the March of Dimes was established. And in a few years, immediately after the March of Dimes, over $1 million in dimes were sent to the United States White House just as uh, a contribution to forward the research against polio. Uh, and to commemorate this, those of us who recognize the dime now see the head of Franklin Roosevelt on the dime in commemoration of the March of Dimes. Now, this money went, and therefore, to conduct research against polio. And most notably, John Enders and his colleagues discovered means to grow the polio virus in the tissues derived from aborted human fetuses. This led, ultimately, to the Nobel Prize in 1954. But undoubtedly, the hero for the uh, polio vaccine is Jonas Salk. Salk, over the years, developed means to grow the virus in monkey cells, mass growth 
and cultivation and propagation of the virus so that you have enough material to use as a vaccine. He developed the immune assays in order to evaluate the quality of our ability to neutralize and inactivate the virus. And ultimately, he developed the means using formaldehyde to kill the virus for such a vaccine. So it wasn't long that they actually initiated and launched the clinical trials for the self vaccine in 1954. 1.8 million children participated in this clinical trial. 420,000 children received the vaccine. And within one year, illustrating the urgency and the importance of this effort to generate a vaccine to deal with the, the pandemic, uh, it was announced in April of 1955 that the trial was a huge success, primarily that the vaccine is absolutely safe and that it is extremely effective in preventing the disease. Now, I'm mentioning this because you notice in April 12, 1955, the results of the trial were announced. And that same day, same afternoon, four hours later, the government, in essence, licensed five companies to produce and distribute the vaccine. Was this hasty? Well, possibly so. Two weeks later, April 26, 1955, six children presented with paralysis due to the vaccine, and all six children received the vaccine from one company, Cutter. Cutter Laboratories had produced the vaccine. They were licensed to do so. They did everything right. However, their vaccine, in some fashion, caused paralysis, caused polio. So the first step was, one day later, they recalled all of its vaccine. What had actually happened? It turns out that two lots of the Cutter vaccine, 120,000 doses, were given to children, most of them first and second year kids, sixth graders, in uh, Idaho, the whole state of Idaho, California, Chicago, other cities. Uh, 220,000 people, therefore, were infected with the infectious virus. 100,000 were what is referred to as community contacts. 70,000 people presented with abortive polio. 164 were paralyzed and 10 were killed. So this is obviously a catastrophic event, an epidemic caused by the vaccine. However, are vaccines, in fact, risky, dangerous? Well, I would, I would argue that in view of the fact that 15,000 Americans were killed yearly at that time from polio, and since then, in essence, we see that the world is primarily polio-free, vaccines are extremely safe and extremely efficacious. Contaminated vaccines, vaccines not produced efficiently, human error, that is the cause of risk here. And so what we have to do over time is to ensure that the production, the manufacturing, the regulation is in place. The vaccine itself, if produced properly, and when produced properly, is obviously uh, extremely efficient, extremely safe, and extremely useful. Now, let me turn to a another disease, unfortunately, that does not have neither a cure nor a vaccine. As you can see, autism has shown a very serious rise in frequency in the United States from 1992, as shown here in the graph, until the present time, in this graph, 2007. There's a constant rise, and there are a lot of people who are trying to associate autism with vaccination. The rationale or the logic is, is understood. Basically, over these same years, there's been an increase in the uses of vaccination. There have been newer, better vaccines implemented and used and subjected to millions and millions and millions of people around the world. And so there are those who are trying to correlate and argue that, in fact, the vaccination is causing autism. The first article that came out to make this actually a clear conclusion of the article was in 1998, an article by Andrew Wakefield. And uh, he and another 12 authors in 1998 had published a study in which they studied 12 autistic children, subjected them to colonoscopy, to biopsies, lumbar puncture, MRI, EEG, and found that there were some indications that measles 
may be growing in the gut of these children, and therefore argued that possibly there may be a connection to the rubella immunization, measles, mumps, rubella, MMR, uh, as we say here in Israel, and that this particular vaccine may be the cause of autism. So how do we deal with this? Now, the first ramifications of this publication of Andrew Wakefield, that MMR may be the cause of autism, was that if we look at the uh, coverage of vaccination in the United Kingdom, in 1998, after the publication, there was a dramatic drop in the compliance and the usage of MMR vaccination. So this immediately had ramifications in the number of cases of measles in the UK. We can see that from 1998, there were about 50 cases in the nation. And by 2008, a number of children had died from complications of measles, and over 1,300 cases were reported. So is there a connection? Does MMR cause autism? Well, in reality, the way we deal with it, the scientific community, is we conduct specific studies, and the strength of science is the fact that it can be objectively reproduced. So in many laboratories, people find the same thing. And if I summarize a number of studies looking at over 5 million children in different cohorts comparing the propensity for autism in correlation or not, with MMR vaccination, it was concluded that there is no correlation whatsoever. But in order to convince you, just a few examples, we can see here, for example, in the study of Dales looking at children in California, there is a clear demonstration here that the rate of use of MMR is constant, whereas there is a continuous rise in autism. There is no correlation, no in, at all relationship between the usage of MMR and the genuine increase in autism. We can see almost the same figure in a study done at the UK in which 305 children were compared, those that did receive, those that didn't receive, and also looking at the rate of vaccination on the one hand and autism on the other. Again, we confirmed that there is a rise in autism over the years, but it has nothing to do with MMR. Maybe the most interesting study is that derived from the cohort in Japan. In Japan, for whatever reasons, and we won't go into it now, they had independently decided to discontinue MMR. And as you can see by the vertical lines here, from 1988 to 1992, they simply withdrew MMR. From 1993, no MMR was given in this particular cohort in Japan, yet there is a constant rise in autism. So withdrawal of the vaccine had no impact on the continuous rise in autism. So basically, we know that autism does not cause, uh, do, excuse me, MMR does not cause autism. Uh, therefore, maybe it's gratifying or maybe not surprising that in, 19, in 2004, Ten of the authors of the original Wakefield paper retracted their conclusions and interpretations and published it formally as a retraction in the same journal in Lancet. So, if it's not MMR, what else in vaccines could be causing autism? So I'd like to refer to an amendment by Frank Pallon, who was a congressman in uh, New Jersey, very much concerned about the environment. And so much so, he uh, required that the FDA, within two years, by the year 1999, should compile a list of all the foods and drugs in which mercury compounds are introduced into those drugs or foods. And in fact, it was found that many vaccines contain thimerosal. Now, thimerosal is a mercury compound. It has been proved previously or was assumed to be totally safe. But, uh, and therefore it was used in vaccinations. It was used because most vaccines were packaged in multi-dose vials. And in order to prevent bacterial contamination, the preservative was introduced. As a, as a source of, of cautionary intent, the FDA therefore suggested that from 1999 to 2001, thimerosal would be removed 100% from all vaccines given to children. 
under the age of six. And therefore, it, whereas there is no indication whatsoever that there has any danger with imerosol, nonetheless, it was removed from the vaccines. And as a result, also vaccinations were packaged in single dose packages so as to overcome the problem of potential bacterial contamination. Now, in July of 1999, just to make sure that the public doesn't scare, the, the government, the FDA and, and public health uh, services came out with a statement. There are no data or evidence of any harm caused by the level of exposure to mercury that some children may have encountered in following the existing immunization schedule. Obviously, this was extremely reassuring. It was clear under the circumstances then that people would not wonder what the government is trying to tell us. If the government assures us that it's safe, then there's certainly something behind this and good that they took out the thimerosal from the vaccines. So very rapidly after this, there became a whole series of articles and certainly a number of people that were claiming that thimerosal, mercury compounds, preservatives and vaccines, they are the cause of autism. Here, for example, is a paper from 2001 published by Sally Bernard. Autism, a novel form of mercury poisoning. Who's Sally Bernard? Sally Bernard was a businesswoman. She was the head of the ARC Research. ARC Research is a marketing research company, has nothing to do with science. But nonetheless, she and her colleague Lynn Wedwood, who was a nurse, who unfortunately had a child who was autistic, they had assumed that in view of the statements, maybe it was in fact mercury poisoning that is causing the autism. And therefore, a number of anti-vaccination lobbies and, and groups have latched onto this and claimed that mercury is in fact causing autism. So a statement was made, was issued in 2004 after reviewing 200 epidemiological and biological studies. All of them reject any causal relationship between thimerosal containing vaccines and autism. So again, extensive studies have been made. Maybe I'll just give you an example of one of them. Here is a study in Denmark. Denmark independently had removed thimerosal in 1992. That being the case, as indicated by the red line, we can see that from 92 there is no thimerosal in any of the Danish vaccines, yet in all three age groups that were monitored, there is a continuous rise in autism, irrespective of the presence or absence of thimerosal. So here again we can see that the vaccines, when made properly and contain what they should, uh, are extremely safe on the one hand, do not cause autism. Uh, and this is also illustrated by the uh, mere fact that if we look back at the graph that we initially looked at, we can see that there is no change in the slope of rise of autism since the removal of thimerosal in 2001 in the United States. Now, wh why is there an increase in autism? We don't really know. There have been uh, statements and, and, and certainly suggestions that it could be uh, broadened definitions of the disease. It certainly is a greater awareness. And there are also better assays, better tests in order to determine the disease. But if there are other factors, we, we don't know yet. But what we do know is autism is not caused by vaccination. So I want to make the statement, and I want to make it clear, that to decide not to vaccinate children is in essence to choose to watch your children suffer from preventable disease and chance that complications will not be fatal. Let me look, for example, at a number of statistics in Israel. Before vaccines, there were about 15,000 children a year that would suffer from the preventable diseases listed below, and hundreds of them would die unnecessarily. These are preventable diseases. Vaccines can, in fact, protect people. And to choose not to vaccinate is to chance the possibilities of the complications of disease and the suffering of the disease itself. So in Israel, as in the United States, as in Europe, we practice a vaccination schedule protecting against 11 diseases as shown here in the slide. And it's proven to be extremely, extremely efficient and necessary. So let's ask ourselves, what's wrong? What's the problem? Why is there such an objection? And so, in fact, I think that some of this stems from Wikipedia, or if you will, Google University. 
What we are seeing here due to www.anything is that people have begun to lose confidence in the scientific community and everybody sees himself as an expert. People find themselves now going into the web and presuming that they understand what years of training requires scientific community to actually discover, argue, debate, with no requirements whatsoever of scientific theory in the sense of reproducibility and objectivity. If you are articulate, if you're charming, if you're convincing, you can say anything you want on YouTube and be quoted as such. The real risk, or at least a major risk, to human public health is the erosion of the public's faith in science. So I'd like to end my talk with a quote from Mark Twain. The trouble with the world is not that people know too little, but that they know so many things that just ain't so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny. Um, I think time has come, unless there is a burning question, and I think these questions can be asked outside, I think we should adjourn. I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers, starting with uh, Dr. Garo, uh, Dr. Shani, Dr. Gishoni, and especially, special thanks to the four graduate students who really showed us that a cohabitation um, with, between famous and mature scientists and scientists at the beginning of their uh, career is a very favorable um, experience that both sides can learn from. So thank you very much, many thanks, uh, and especially also to uh, uh, Alexi. Thank you. Uh, there is something to eat outside and hopefully some music. <laughs>